Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to sunny San Jose. Um, I have to say that uh, driving in from Fresno, I was uh, relieved that it was not 150 degrees outside as it was when I left. Um, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Doug uh, to give us some instructions and then to take roll. Oh, wait, I have to do this. Okay, now go. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll start off with the roll, if that's okay. Commissioner Bradshaw. Here. Thank you. Commissioner Davis. Commissioner Falcone. Here. Commissioner Grisby. Present. Vice Chair Guardino. He'll be right back. There he is. There he is. Say Vice, here. Say Vice here. Chair Guardino. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Lugo. Here. Commissioner Liu. Here. Commissioner Martinez. Present. Commissioner Norton. Commissioner Tavoloni. Chair Eager. Here. Senator Newman. Assembly Member Friedman. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the June 2022 CTC meeting. For those, for, for those participating online, please note that because this is a two-day meeting, you will need to use a separate link to attend the meeting tomorrow. The links can be found on the first page of the meeting agenda. Please use a questions tab on the webinar if you have any questions about this. The Commission's meeting agenda is located under the handout tab and on our website at catc.ca.gov. Live closed captioning and American Sign Language translation are being provided for the webinar for this meeting. You can access the closed caption services through links found on the Commission meetings page on our website, and you, sh you should see the American Sign Language translator on your screen. Any document the CTC creates can be translated into any language you need. Simply email us at ctc at catc.ca.gov and we will have them return to you as quickly as possible. For our presenters, if you're on the agenda to make a presentation and you are going to be remote, please do your best to be succinct. Please remember to speak at a steady pace to allow our translating services adequate time for accurate translation. And also turn on your camera if you have one. For our members of the public, both in person and remotely, we welcome comments from the public as part of each item at this meeting. For those of you attending in person, please submit a speaker slip to the clerk, and that is me, I'm the clerk, the front of the room, and let, to let us know that you want to comment on an item. There's a space on the form to put the, the item number you would like to talk about. For those attending via GoToWebinar, you should see the webinar control panel likely located on the right-hand side of your screen. There you'll find the raise hand feature as well as the questions tab. We encourage you to use the raised hand feature as early into the item as you can, give the system time to acknowledge you. Alternately, you may use the questions tab to submit your comment. Please, please be sure to include the item number you are commenting on. Commission staff will read the comment on your behalf. As a reminder, each registered attendee is provided a unique link and phone number to access the webinar. These should not be shared with other participants as they are registered to your name and can create confusion for staff when making comments. For all of our meeting attendees, please do your best to be concise with your comments. Please make sure that your comments add new information. If you agree with a previous speaker, simply make that statement. Please remember to speak at a steady pace to allow our translating services adequate time for accurate translation. Since we often have many speakers, we ask that you make your point in three minutes or less. If for some reason we have many speakers on a topic, we reserve the right to limit comments to one minute as needed. Thank you for joining us today. We know your time is valuable and we appreciate you sharing some of it with us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Doug. At this time, I will call up Therese McMillan to do the welcome to the region. There you go. I'm not Therese McMillan. Uh, she was unable to make it today, unfortunately. So I will be giving the welcome to the region um, kind of talk. But before that, I would like to um, introduce Mayor Licardo to give a few opening comments. Good afternoon. I'm not Therese McMillan either. 
Well, welcome to San Jose. It's great to have you all here. Uh, Chair Yeager, Vice Chair Gordino, all the members of the board and Executive Director Weiss, we are uh, thrilled to see California Transportation Commission here in San Jose. Uh, we are so grateful for your work and your service to our great state of California. So thank you for all that you do. I don't know whatever they pay you as a per diem for your meetings. I know it's not enough because I've heard uh, there's a lot of work in this effort. Um, uh, I am uh, the mayor here of the city of San Jose. My name is Sam Licardo, and uh, I have the great honor of representing the 10th largest city in the United States. And I would be remiss in my duties if it did not take 30 seconds to also give a pitch that any other mayor would give to this commission to talk about our transportation needs. We have a lot of them, but I'll mention just one in particular because I couldn't help but notice uh, that with Governor Newsom's leadership and the leadership of our legislature, the TRCP program uh, provides a lot of opportunity for capital expansion in our city. And I don't know if the slide is able, nope, it's not, that's all right. We'll just do this verbally. Uh, we have a little project we call affectionately BART to Silicon Valley. Uh, the good news is we had unbelievable support from our community on four separate occasions. Two thirds of our community has supported taxing themselves to pay for BART extension a service that once only served uh, communities to our north is now finally opened in North San Jose, and we want to continue to be constructed all the way through our downtown onto Santa Clara in our downtown where it will connect with not just a future high speed rail system, which we know that you're all deeply familiar with, uh, but also existing systems like ACE, the Capital Corridor, uh, Express the uh, um, uh, Caltrain, which is now being electrified. Uh, the uh, Highway 17 Express, Amtrak, uh, and of course, our own VTA systems, light rail, bus rapid transit, all in one place. A connectivity that we cannot achieve anywhere else in the Bay Area. It's right here in the South Bay at Deerdon Station. We think this project's awfully important. Uh, we built the first phase under budget uh, and completed just a couple of years ago. We know that this second phase uh, getting all the way through to Deardon and on to Santa Clara has run into the challenge of this pandemic. And I know you are all familiar with major transit projects that have incurred significant cost escalations as a result of that pandemic. So we are working hard with our partners at the federal level uh, to ensure we can have a greater com federal commitment uh, and see how we can make that happen. We obviously would love to see that happen also at the state level as well, so that we can really get shovels in the ground. Uh, we have got our contractor ready to go for the main portion of this project, that is the tunneling. Uh, and they are already working hard on improvements in engineering design that are shaving costs. We're confident we can get this moving in partnership with the CTC and many others throughout the state. Thank you again for coming to San Jose. We're thrilled you're here. And I should add, welcome to our region and to Silicon Valley. Now, I give you back to the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. I, I think we have a question or a comment. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mayor Licardo, it is such a pleasure to be on this side of the dais with you at the uh, at the podium there. Thank you for your leadership to this community. Eight years on the council, seven and a half years now as mayor of the 10th largest city in America. And you mentioned the self-help county nature of this community. And I would just want to share with my colleagues the leadership role that Mayor Sam Licardo has played for more than two decades in those efforts. In fact, it was this month, 22 years ago, that he walked into a campaign office to set aside a very successful uh, private law practice to serve on a campaign 100 hours plus a week to try to drive that two thirds vote to victory, which uh, he was an integral part of that team that did with 70.4% of the vote. He Thank did you. similar. Uh, in 2008, he did similar in 2016, and again with Regional Measure 3 in 2018 for the nine county Bay Area, and again in 2020 with Measure RR for the three county Caltrain measure. His work on regional transportation improvements, especially BART, has made me want to change his name forever to Bart Licardo. <laughs> uh, we want to thank you for your work, Mayor. Thank you, Vice Chair Bordino. But of course, as you know, um, 
by Sir Pordino is uh, far too modest because in fact, he was leading those campaigns in each case. That was his office I walked into and he was nice enough to give me a job. The pay wasn't great, but it was a fun job anyway. Your pay thank you wasn't all. great, <laughs> but we thank you for your leadership. And you know, when you get two Sicilians together, they're unstoppable. So thanks, thanks. again, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Well, oh, and we promise not to trash your seat up here while we're here the next two days. No promise. So good afternoon. Um, thank you, Tara Eager and the uh, commissioners. I am Teresa Rommel, not Teresa uh, McMillan. I'm the director of the funding policy and program section at the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, which is the nine county Bay Area uh, uh, metropolitan planning organization. And MTC's executive director, Therese McMillan, uh, does regret that she's unable to be here today. But on behalf of Therese and all of the MTC staff, uh, welcome to the Bay Area. I hope I can get this work here. That's not my thing. <laughs> There it goes. Okay, thank you. Okay, that looks more like it. Um, so San Jose is the Bay Area's largest city, both in area as well as in population, with just north of about a million residents. And as the proclaimed capital of Silicon Valley, San Jose is a major driver, not just in the Bay Area economy, but also for the state and the nation as well. And as Mayor Licardo uh, mentioned, San Jose is, is working to be a more affordable, connected, diverse and healthy city for all. The work in San Jose and Santa Clara County is representative of the shared vision and goals of the Bay Area's long range transportation plan. Plan Bay Area 2050 is the long range regional transportation plan and sustainable community strategy jointly adopted last fall by MTC and the Associ Association of Bay Area Governments. Um, the plan contains, uh, it's comprised of 35 strategies that span transportation, housing, the economy, and the environment with racial, racial equity interwoven into each of the strategies. The plan is, found, is founded on a very meticulous analysis and informed by rigorous public engagement uh, with an expanded scope that introduces strategies for long-term economic development and environmental resilience that align with the state's forward thinking on climate strategies and policies like the CTC's Senate Bill 1, competitive funding programs, and the California State Transportation Agency's Climate Action, for, Action Plan for Transportation and Infrastructure, and otherwise known as CAPTI. And MPC is in support of the proposed SB1 competitive program guidelines that will be acted on today. And we're eager to meet and discuss our proposed project list in the future. Since it has been four years uh, since you were last in San Jose in the Bay Area, we wanted to highlight a few of MTC's priorities and recent policy updates for the region that also support state priorities. Oops, I'll just go back one more. Uh, Plan Bay Area 2050 strives to guide the Bay Area to a more vibrant, more connected, more diverse, and more affordable and healthier future much as Cal SDA does with its 10 guiding principles in CAPTI. But as we know all too well, neither the state nor our region uh, can achieve this, these goals alone. To realize our regional vision and the state's priorities, we must continue to work together and in tandem. An example of our partnership is MTC's longstanding commitment to reduce the region's environmental footprint and to protect residents from environmental harm. MTC actively works with stakeholders to develop funding principles, priorities, and strategies that align with CAPTI strategies and with SB1 funding programs. Since you were last here four years ago, BART has opened two new stations, Milpitas um, in Northern Santa Clara County and Berryessa in North San Jose. Uh, the region is also, also is working to electrify public transportation infrastructure and to advance investments in light, medium, and heavy duty zero emission vehicle infrastructure. 
MTC recently adopted the Bay Area Express Lane Strategic Plan, which aligns the purpose, goals, and strategies of our Express Lanes network with the regional priorities outlined in Plan Bay Area 2050. Completion of the Express Lanes network will provide more efficient roadways, more seamless and reliable bus service, and use dynamic toll pricing to create more revenue streams from, uh, for other transportation and corridor improvements. The Regional Express Lanes Stra Strategic Plan works in tandem with the Silicon Valley Express Lanes Program in Santa Clara County. MTC is in the process of completing the region's transit-oriented communities policy. In addition to executing goals from Plan Bay Area 2050, this plan aims to develop communities around transit stations and along transit corridors that support transit and promote diversity, equity, and access to services. Some targeted strategies in the plan include increasing residential and commercial densities in transit rich areas, prioritizing bus transit, active transportation, and shared mobility within and to and from transit rich areas, especially to equity priority communities, and fostering and supporting partnerships to create equitable transportation oriented communities. MTC plans to adopt this, this policy uh, this coming fall. Um, and when it comes to the Plan Bay Area 2050 vision of a better connected, healthier, and more affordable and vibrant region, the safety of our pedestrians and cyclists is essential. This summer, MTC adopted a comprehensive update to our complete streets policy, policy which is a component of our new regional active transportation plan now in development. The refreshed complete streets policy now requires all regionally supported and funded projects to consider the accommodation of people who walk, bike, and roll as part of the project scoping. The Regional Active Transportation Plan will guide investments in active transportation infrastructure, policy development, and implementation. The plan will also include a prioritized five-year implementation plan to support active transportation and to meet the transportation-related needs revealed by the COVID pandemic. And with a sp specific focus on safety, MTC is also developing its Regional Vision Zero policy to support actions and strategies for eliminate, eliminating traffic deaths and injuries among bicyclists and pedestrians by 2030. And woven into all of MTC's work is an emphasis on social and racial equity throughout the Bay Area. MTC strives to advance equity through carefully considered investments and policies directed at historically underserved and systemically marginalized groups, including people with low incomes and in communities of color. By setting policies and delivering programs, holding ourselves accountable to data-backed results and taking real action, MTC aims to help create a Bay Area where everyone can thrive. And MTC's driving focus is expanding mobility and access to opportunity for all. A few examples of this include uh, the programs shown there, the recently implemented Clipper Start Fair Discount Program, which provides single ride transit fare discounts for eligible low income individuals across the region. MTC's Fast Track Start Pilot Program will, uh, will establish express lanes tolling discounts for low income drivers. Um, and MTC's continued investment in the region's bike share system, which includes the Bike Share for All program that provides an option for reduced cost membership. We at MTC are eager to continue working in partnership with the state to realize Plan Bay Area 2050's vision for a region that is more affordable, connected, diverse, and healthy and vibrant for all. And so with that, I wanna thank you and um, encourage you to enjoy your time here in the Bay Area. Thank you so much. Uh, I do have to say, looking at all these pictures, um, I come from the Central Valley of California and I do have transportation envy, I don't know. <laughs> as we were walking uh, from the hotel here and had to stop on the corner because your light rail went by and then the bus came around the corner and then the people were on their bikes and a scooter went by and it was a uh, transportation euphoria really right there on the corner. So <laughs> you're doing a really good job. Okay, we'll take it, so thank much. you. Do you have any other questions, comments? Madam Chair, I would say that I, I I noticed the same thing, and I, I thought it might have been like you know they they set us up for this. <laughs> it was it was so it was so inclusive of every mode of transportation that it was very suspicious. Yeah, was it me? Stopped. I promise. No. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.
And with that, I'll turn it back over to Doug for the approval of the minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We'll uh, do both the items in one vote. So tab three is the approval of the minutes from the June 29th, 30th CTC meeting. And tab four is the commissioners a meeting for compensation. Staff recommends your approval. Thank you, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Ms. Davis and Norton, yes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Oh. Thank you, Commissioner Bradshaw. Uh, motion carries. We will then move on to Mitch, Commissioner Executive Director. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's great to finally be back in the Bay Area for a commission meeting. And as most of you know, this is uh, our first in-person meeting here since the pandemic. Uh, it's great to be here. I really appreciate the warm welcome that Mayor Lacarta and Teresa Rommel gave us. Um, it's just really nice to, to be here to see, go out and see different things and not just be on our computers. Uh, to start with, I want to offer my deepest condolences to the family and friends of Caltrans District 6 engineer, Ali Shabazz, who was killed in a car crash on August 8th while heading to a job site. Ali worked for Caltrans for 16 years and he leaves behind his wife and their eight children. I wanted to make everyone aware that a memorial fund in his honor is being established through the California Transportation Foundation and I encourage you all to donate. Again, I offer my deepest condolences to Ali's family. Commissioners, we have several policy items on our agenda today and tomorrow that are the accumulation of year-long efforts to transform our transportation system to make it safer, cleaner, and more equitable while continuing to support a vibrant economy. To start with, we're recommending adoption of the SB1 Competitive Program Guidelines, which incorporate the Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure Strategies relevant to our programs, including better prioritization of projects that encourage mode shift and support the transition to clean vehicles, inclusion of pro housing principles to support housing production and vehicle miles traveled reductions, enhanced community engagement considerations, and increased technical assistance for program applicants. I wanna thank Matthew Yazgat and each of the SB1 program managers, Naveen Habib, Hannah Walter, Bridget Driller, and Anya Allabacher, as well as their staffs, for their efforts since last August to develop these guidelines. The team held 23 public workshops to solicit input and managed to achieve a broad consensus from our diverse stakeholders. With your approval of these guidelines, the call for projects will commence. Combined across the three programs, we have nearly $2, nearly $2 billion available to award this cycle. These funds will help California's transportation agencies in their efforts to draw down federal discretionary funds being made available through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Towards that end, we continue to align our programs with the federal competitive programs and to help agencies with their efforts to leverage more funding. Uh, we also attended two CalSTA workshops recently to inform guidelines for their upcoming port and freight infrastructure program, which is 1.2 billion available from the state general fund to help ease supply chain congestion and increase the capacity to move goods in California. As we initiate the call for projects for our SB1 Trade Quarters Enhancement Program, we're encouraged that the focus on freight by both funding programs will serve California's complex transportation needs by enhancing good movement systems. In addition to the call for projects for the SB1 programs, I'm also pleased that today we'll be, in, we'll be requesting the approval to increase the funding for the current cycle of the Active Transportation Program by $1 billion from the state's general fund. As you know, this augmentation was the result of strong advocacy, advocacy efforts by the Commission to address the substantial backlog of projects lacking funding. After the state budget was signed at the end of June authorizing this increase, we held a workshop in mid-July to talk with stakeholders about how to apply the funds. We heard virtually unanimous, and unanimous agreement for the funds to be used in the current cycle since we are, we are already underway evaluating project applications. The $1 billion increase, along with the nearly $200 million increase in funding, funding from the Federal Infrastructure Investments and Job Act, is gonna help us fund many more critical projects than we've been able to fund in the past. One uh, I'd like to highlight, just one of the examples of the transformative projects that we'd like to fund. Uh, last Thursday, Lori Waters, our Active Transportation Program Manager, spoke at, spoke at the groundbreaking 
of the Coastal Rail Trail Segment 7, 7 Phase 2 project in the city of Santa Cruz. We awarded over $9 million for this pr project last cycle. When the segment is complete, there'll be two miles of Coastal Rail Trail in Santa Cruz connecting over 30,000 residents who live within one mile of the trail to schools, work, beaches, shopping, and other activities. The project is part of the larger Coastal Rail Trail, which is a 32-mile bicycle and pedestrian multi-use path adjacent to the Santa Cruz branch line. This is a good example of how many of the projects we're funding are part of larger active transportation networks, which increase the benefit to users. We also have another SB1 program on our agenda, the, the SB1 Local Streets and Roads program. This is a formulaic program for cities and counties for basic road maintenance and rehabilitation. The commission's role is to determine that each city and county has met the statutory eligibility criteria to re receive funds. Our team, headed by Alicia Sequera, does a tremendous job each year reaching out to California's more than 500 cities and counties to make sure that each one can access these funds. We have almost all jurisdictions ready to be deemed eligible at this meeting, uh, and about a dozen that we expect will be ready by our next meeting in October. We anticipate having 100% eligibility for this cycle, which will be the fourth year in a row. Also related to XB1, SB1 and Fix It First projects on our agenda today is our evaluation of Caltrans's progress towards reducing deferred maintenance on the highway system. As a reminder, SB1 set performance targets for the condition of four asset classes for Caltrans to achieve by 2027, and the commission set annual bet benchmarks to measure this progr progress. Our evaluation is similar to last year, with Caltrans demonstrating that they're on their way to the pavement condition targets and to achieve achieving the fixed 500 bridge targets. We'll, more, we'll have a more detailed report under tab 63. Commissioners, earlier this month, we, along with CalSTA and Caltrans, issued a joint call for applications to serve on our new Interagency Equity Advisory Committee. We're very excited to take this step towards getting the committee up and running. We'll be holding an informational webinar for interested applicants on August 25th, and applications are due on September 2nd. We'll be reviewing the applications and recommending committee memberships this fall. If anyone out there is interested in applying, please email raceandequity at dot.ca.gov. You can also reach out to our Associate Deputy Director of Equ Equity and Engagement, Sequoia Erasmus. In addition, we've been continuing our, list continuing our listening sessions with CalSTA and Caltrans, and we have an update on that effort in tab 13. Earlier this month, we requested that Caltrans initiate an update of the 2017 Regional Transportation Plan guidelines. We'll kick off the update this fall, and we look forward to collaborating with Caltrans and all our stakeholders on this effort. We will present a more detailed, uh, more detailed information on the scope and the timing of this update at the October Commission meeting. Uh, one, another thing I'd like to highlight is uh, altogether on our agenda, we have $2 billion in project allocations this month which will create over 25,000 jobs. As you know, our team and Caltrans work collaboratively to make sure allocation requests are ready for your approval and to identify issues through the reporting process. However, as you heard at our last meeting, we've identified some issues recently with the, the process for tracking time extensions that has caused us some concern. We'll hear an update on uh, efforts to fix this issue when we get to tab 123. Uh, now I have a few upcoming events that I'd like to make everyone aware of. On August 23rd and October 4th, we'll be holding virtual workshops to update our SB1 accountability and transparency guidelines. On September 16th, we will have our next meeting of the Road Charge Technical <coughs> Advisory Committee. On September 21st and 22nd, we'll be having a town hall in the Lake Tahoe area. Uh, also, the tri-state meeting with the Transportation Commissions of Oregon and Washington that was scheduled for September 13th and 14th uh, had to be canceled. Uh, we look forward to, to meeting with our fellow commissions at some time uh, next year. To update our meeting schedule to reflect this change, I will be requesting at the end of my presentation uh, that you delegate to me the authority to make minor changes to our meeting schedule as necessary. Um, I, I have no changes on our staff to announce, but I do want to, to make you aware if you haven't heard that Undersecretary Canove is leaving CalSTA 
uh, and to become the deputy administrator at the California Division of the Federal Highway Administration. So I expect that we'll be seeing her occasionally still. Thanks for taking my presentation. <laughs> I, hope, I hope to get, it, between what I'm saying, Vince, I hope to get everything that you and Mike are planning to say. <laughs> Uh, I just want to thank Alyssa for her collaboration uh, over the over the last few years and her efforts to uh, help advance the state's transportation goals. And of course, we continue looking forward to working with her uh, while she's in her new position. Uh, finally, uh, as, as you know, commissioners, I, I recently returned from a vacation in uh, in Denmark, so I did want to share a little bit about it. Uh, yeah, I spent a lot of time in Copenhagen, and they're well known for bicycling. And they have a tremendous amount of uh, bicycle infrastructure that they've they've made to facilitate this. It really is, um, a, you know, it really made me believe that if we are able to build this, it will be used. So, uh, you know, there on the left, you don't see very often here in this country. It would go back to last one. Uh, you've got uh, the bicyclists waiting for a, a bike and pedestrian drawbridge to go down. Uh, in the middle, uh, that is. Uh, near one end of one of the bike highways that people talk about a lot out in Copenhagen. And on the right, uh, that's probably six o'clock one evening uh, on uh, a street that's reported to be one of the busiest bicycling streets uh, in the world. At some point on a bridge just near there, they counted uh, 30,000 trips in one day. Next slide, please. Uh, and so here, th this is just, you can see some of the infrastructure, dedicated bike lanes, that, that make it safer. Uh, on the right, you can see there's a, a signal and lanes. Almost everywhere I went, there was uh, either bike lanes or, or that were separated or painted and bike signals. And a couple of times I found myself on a street that didn't have something like that. I actually stopped because I was worried that I was somewhere that I wasn't supposed to be. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is some more of the infrastructure on the left. There's a a changeable message sign that's that's directed towards the cyclist and then there's wayfinding that they have uh, at busy intersections and then on the right is a speed feedback sign i you know unfortunately i didn't know the bicycle speed limit so i had no idea what i was supposed to do with that information but it was good to know um but i didn't spend all my time just biking around i, I did some other things of course uh, my big decision every day was where to where to have a danish and so uh, I, I did a little bit of that. Uh, and then my other big decision was where to have lunch. And so I, I did a little bit of that too. W yes, every lunch. Every, I was on vacation. I was on vacation. <laughs> um, uh, and I just wanna conclude my report by uh, recommending the action I mentioned earlier that you delegate authority to me to adjust the 2022 meeting schedule as needed. Thank you, Mitch. Um, now we have vacation envy. Now we've moved on to that. Um, I will entertain a motion to accept the report, including um, allowing uh, Mitch the authority to make uh, changes to the schedule. Motion to approve, Martinez. Martinez, second. Second Grisby. Second Grisby. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, motion carries. We are now on to commission reports. Um, and as Mitch said, uh, we in District 6, there um, was a tragic death with Ali Shabazz. And I, I know, Mike, you're going to give us uh, information about him and his life and his family. Um, this certainly reminds us about safety and about why we're all here. Um, and I do want to do a special thank you to District 6 Director Diana Gomez for going to his services on our behalf. Um, thank you for attending those for us. And we will be adjourning today um, on behalf of Mr. Shabazz. At this time, I would also like to uh, welcome Commissioner Lugo to her first in-person meeting. Welcome aboard. <laughs> We're glad to have you. And we know next time you're bringing the baby because we've all requested uh, mm. to, to bring her at the next one. Um, do we have any commissioner reports? I think Commissioner Falcone, you'd like to give a report for us? Thank you. Madam Chair, um, so first of all, I'll, I also would like to welcome Commissioner Lugo. It is um, wonderful to have a, a new uh, colleague. It's even more wonderful that I am now not part of the new commissioners uh, anymore. Uh, for the past year, we were part of a, a group that was lovingly called the 
COVID commissioners coined by our chair. And so perhaps you and Commissioner Bradshaw can create your own name, maybe not commission, COVID commissioner, uh, <laughs> but we welcome you, Dr. Lugo. We look forward to, to working with you. Second of all, I, also, I too want to express condolences to the Caltrans family for, for your recent loss. Um, and also, since I wasn't here in June for, for your loss of uh, Quandra McGandry uh, during her work um, uh, maintaining our, our highways, uh, that when, when fatality is, is, is way too much. And so I want to underscore um, our support for, for anything that, that this commission can support in terms of reducing the risk of, of death uh, to our workers on the highway. So I wanted to express my condolences uh, to Caltrans and to her family. Finally, uh, on a slightly positive note, this commission um, has been very supportive of funding for uh, Otay Mesa East Port of Entry. And I'm glad to say that on August 22nd, which is next week, there will be a groundbreaking. This project has been pregnant a long time. And so finally, um, and personally, I'd like to share that I was part of the very early conversations of this project 22, 23 years ago when I was a assembly legislative staffer working for assembly member Denise Ucheni, who was chair of the assembly budget at the time. And we were always fighting or advocating against border fences at that time. And the Caltrans director for District 11, Gary Gallegos approached us about creating a, another port of entry. And he sold it in a way where instead of fences, we should be building more ports of entry. And so that sold us, though we, we did push back and say, well, wait a minute, Gary, we haven't even finished funding State Route 905 and you're already thinking of another port of entry with a, a connecting highway. But um, it was compelling that because Otay Mesa port of entry was already heavily impacted and, and many of us have seen the impacts of, of the many, many hours of queuing and the trucks um, that we, certainly need another port of entry. And so it's been a, a huge, huge collective effort, not just in California, but um, in our federal government and the governments of Mexico, it's been very delicate and a complex project. And so we're so happy that finally that we'll get to see a groundbreaking um, next week. And so I wanted to um, let the commission know that the efforts that um, you know that you've all been working on is starting to come to fruition on that project. So, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Do we have any other reports? I will entertain a motion to accept the commission reports. Move. That was Vice Chair Gardino with. Okay. Commissioner Davis seconding. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Thank you, motion carries. We will now move to CalSTA Direct Deputy Secretary, Darwin Musavi. Welcome. Thank you, thank you, Chair Eager. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I am Darwin Musavi, Deputy Secretary for Environmental Policy and Housing Coordination. Um, Secretary Omashakin, unfortunately, could not make it to this meeting and sends his regards, but I'm happy to be able to fill in for him in my hometown, so thanks for, for having me here in San Jose. Um, I'd like to start on behalf, uh, I'd like to first actually start um, and mention um, Alyssa Canove, our fabulous undersecretary, as was mentioned, has recently departed CalSTA. I'll leave it to Vince to share more on that and, and um, not steal his thunder uh, any more than Mitch already has a little bit here. But uh, we're very thankful for her service and look forward to working with her um, in her um, future endeavors. Uh, I wanted to, to, to start um, to, by echoing the sentiments that were already raised um, and share CalSTA's heartfelt condolences for the loss of a second Caltrans family member this year. Uh, Caltrans engineer Ali Shabazz, as was mentioned, died following a collision on the night of August 7th while he was on his, job, on his way to a job site in District 6. 
Um, he had been with Caltrans for more than 16 years and is survived by his wife, Nia, and their eight children. He also leaves behind friends and his entire Caltrans family. We join Caltrans in mourning and are grateful Caltrans um, will be honoring him. On Friday evening, we also lost Ventura County Board of Supervisor Chair Carmen Ramirez, who was struck and killed in a crosswalk in Oxnard. And these are two um, of many painful reminders of why CalSTA and our departments continue to make safety our highest priority. Um, shifting gears, when uh, Secretary Omashakin spoke at the last commission meeting on June 29th, uh, we were um, on the cusp of, but a day away from um, enacting our historical budget uh, for fiscal year 2022-23. And the exciting details of the transportation package were known at the time, um, but still not final. So wanted to take a moment to kind of go through some of the key budget details, which I'm sure many of you are, are aware of by now, but we're you know excited um, that the budget reflects California's highest transportation priorities and will accelerate our transition to a cleaner, safer, and more connected and more equitable transportation system. Um, it includes $4.2 billion in Prop 1A funding for high-speed rail, $3.65 in the Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program, plus another $2 billion in each of the following two fiscal years for a total of $7.65 billion. $1.05 billion for active transportation, as, as was mentioned earlier, and $150 million for a new Highways to Boulevards um, pilot program. There's also a $1.2 billion one-time port and freight infrastructure program, which is separate from the transportation package and will be awarded by CalSTA. With the help of listening sessions that included CTC participation, CalSTA has already developed staff guidelines uh, for the new supply chain infrastructure program. We hope to put out a call for projects as early as next month and award funding around the end of the year. Uh, earlier this week, Secretary Omishakin joined Administrator Amit Bose of the Federal Railroad Administration at the ports of LA and Long Beach to highlight the unprecedented opportunities to invest in long-term upgrades to Southern California's multimodal freight network. Uh, Secretary Omishakin and Administrator Bose pledged to enhance coordination to maximize the historic levels of federal and state infrastructure funding to build a more efficient, sustainable, and resilient goods movement system. As part of uh, the new port and freight infrastructure program, we want to invest in a way that will not only grow California's economy and increase freight options, but also reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve safety in communities that are most heavily impacted by goods movement. As in everything we do, we're seeking to advance our core policy goals of climate action, safety, and equity in that program. Speaking of equity, wanted to um, echo uh, Director Weiss's sentiments in celebrating the recent call for applications uh, to serve on the Interagency Transportation Equity Advisory Committee. Members of the Equity Advisory Committee will review, rev advise, and make recommendations on transportation-related plans, programs, and policies to CalSTA, the Commission, and Caltrans during open public meetings. Committee membership is intended to elevate diverse and historically marginalized voices in California. Um, originally called for as part of CAPTI, we see this as an important next step in CalSTA's efforts to center equity in our work and thank the Commission and Caltrans for their partnership over the last year in forming um, this committee and are excited to see it launch. Uh, Madam Chair, as uh, mentioned in the budget, we had uh, $7.6 billion for the next three years of TIRCP. Uh, these investments will follow nearly $8 million, $800 million, sorry, um, that CalSTA awarded to 23 projects um, statewide last month as part of the fifth cycle of awards. These grants kick off a period of historic investment to improve and expand public transportation throughout California while positioning the state to strongly compete for significant uh, new federal funding through IIJA. With a total of nearly 2 billion um, consisting of federal, state, and local funds, the 23 projects will directly benefit disadvantaged communities, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by an estimated 4.3 million metric tons, which is equivalent to taking more than 930,000 gas-powered cars off the road. Um, as Secretary Omishakin has previously mentioned at a commission meeting, this was the first TIRCP award cycle to incorporate CAPDI into its guidelines. Um, and it's emblematic of how CalSTA is implementing CAPDI throughout our various programs. 
um, as as you are, um, as Mitch mentioned earlier. Um, uh, lastly, wanted to touch on our IIJ implementation efforts. Earlier this month, California submitted its National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Deployment Plan, also known as the NEVI Plan, uh, for review and approval by the Federal Joint Office of Energy and Transportation. California's NEVI Plan lays out a framework for how the estimated 384 million we receive over the next five years uh, will be um, will complement the state's EV infrastructure investments as part of a multi-pronged approach to drastically cut climate change emissions from the transportation sector. And on a similar note, recently um, uh, the Federal Highway Administration released a draft proposal for the creation of performance measures for greenhouse gas emissions across the national highway system. And uh, with the transportation sector accounting for roughly half of all emissions, this is obviously a crucial step. Uh, this proposed rule will drive our collective planning efforts toward a healthier future. And as such, we're thankful um, to Caltrans um, and, and Director Tony Tavares um, for signing a multi-state letter to FHWA in support of the rule. USDOT also has announced more notices of funding opportunities, including the Reconnecting Communities Pilot Program, which is one we're particularly interested in because it represents a big step forward uh, toward unifying communities that have been divided by transportation infrastructure in the past and begins to make up for some of those past harms. Uh, this pilot program also stands in lockstep with the um, new Highways to Boulevards program that I mentioned earlier in my remarks um, that was originally called for in CAPTA and was just enacted in the state budget. Uh, finally, in advance of the one-year anniversary of IIJ in November, we will soon be highlighting some uh, federally funded infrastructure projects throughout the state that demonstrate the once-in-a-generation possibilities of IIJ. Looking forward to showcasing how we're putting the historic influx of federal infrastructure funding to work right here in California to improve our transportation assets, create jobs, and tackle priorities like combating climate change and increasing roadway safety. Uh, I'd be remiss uh, to not point out that California uh, transit rail ports and zero emission vehicle efforts continue to benefit from IIJ funding announcements. You may have heard uh, that last week USDOT announced uh, um, 119 million in raised grants for California, including 25 million for high-speed rail extension from Madera to Merced, um, funding for grade separations at the Port of Los Angeles and other complete streets improvement projects, transit investments, and more throughout the state. Uh, this week, USDOT confirmed nearly 236 million in grants, uh, the most of any state, to um, further accelerate our nation-leading transition to zero emission transit. Um, so on that note of those uh, investments coming to California, I want to conclude my remarks and thank you for having me. Thank you. Welcome home. Thanks. Um, you know, Director Rice, just before you were speaking, we were just talking about the monumental task of infrastructure for zero emission vehicles in California. So um, I look forward to reading to the NEVI report um, to, to see what that plan is as we move forward. So good luck with that. Thanks. Um, does anyone else have any questions or comments? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's appropriate or, or maybe you give me some guidance, but as we move towards an all electric California, it would seem that um, and we're working towards making sure. Yeah, it says, it says it's on. I didn't make it close enough. Um, I'm sorry to say, I'm not sure this is the right place or, or maybe you can point me in the right direction. So as we move to an all electric California and we're trying to figure out where we find all this power um, and we're trying to make sure we don't further disadvantage communities that are already disadvantaged, what, are, what can be done to see that PG&E uh, SDG&E, SoCal Edison, instead of um, getting these constant uh, rate increase pass-throughs pass by persuading three um, commissioners at the PUC um, that we don't start taking off the shareholders' backs instead of continuing to pass these increases on the public, especially for people who can barely pay their bills already. So I don't know if that may not be the right question for you, but you're a smart young guy. You may have some ideas to where I need to go. I appreciate that, Commissioner Davis. And you're, you're right to note that I may not be the, the individual that can answer your questions, but 
um, you know, happy to, to, to follow up and, and connect you to the right folks in the administration, because these are obviously issues that the administration more broadly is already thinking about and working on. So okay. I'm happy I, to follow up on that. that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Yes, thanks for the presentation and the update. Um, as the agency contemplates how to divvy up the port and freight funding, I was just thinking how, you know, there's there's been quite a bit of effort with portside communities and regions in in um, in creating or, or developing their Community and the community emissions reduction programs. How are those being integrated into your decision making as to how to allocate those fundings? That's a really good question, and I'm not the expert on our guidelines on that, but I'll uh, take a, a stab at it and happy to follow up with further detail. I, I do know that in our kind of guidelines process right now, one we are hearing. From those groups um, and and how they want to see um, um, their efforts reflected in the guidelines. Uh, I know we have taken um, steps to make sure that we have a strong, robust kind of community engagement requirements in uh, the guidelines to ensure that previous planning processes uh, are not only included, but that those previous planning processes were robust um, uh, in nature. So. Uh, in terms of specifics um, and you know how those plans are specific specifically are or aren't called out in the guidelines, I'm happy to follow up on that with you. Thank you. I, I think Commissioner Bradshaw, you had a question or a comment? Uh, yeah, I uh, wish I could be there in person. Uh, uh, Chair Eager, it's wonderful uh, in the Valley. I'm in Visalia and it's very hot, so I'm jealous of y'all. Great to see y'all and uh, also just real quick, I'd take time, but uh, Welcome, uh, Commissioner Lugo. It's an honor to be in the new class uh, with you. Um, really quick, thank you for the great report. Uh, just, I may be piggybacking a little bit um, with uh, Commissioner Davis, but one of the ongoing concerns uh, I've raised it before is as we move towards ZEV uh, and the impacts for working folks that are really up against it, especially with some of the things we're trying to solve here, which is transportation challenges, uh, but the availability of electronic vehicles and programs the state I've been leads with it that have had that have not really come through to help folks be able to even get uh, zero emissions vehicle, right? Again, speaking from a working class perspective, just if there's places, maybe I'll be going shoulder to shoulder uh, with Brother Rocco on this, but we'd like to engage more on that and how as we roll out these great programs that we're not uh, creating an economic barrier or something that's not achievable for average working folks. So I just wanted to raise those couple issues and follow your guidance on that for next steps. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bradshaw. I appreciate the question, Commissioner Bradshaw. And we, we certainly recognize, I think, the, the infrastructure goes in hand with vehicle access and, and um, you know, particularly when talking about uh, you know, single occupancy vehicles and the general public. and. There are uh, various avenues within the administration where there's coordination between programs at the CDC, CARB, um, and and uh, uh, you know now uh, Caltrans with the NEVI program uh, to to coordinate those various efforts and what funding is going towards what types of programs and how do we make sure that access follows um, infrastructure or or vice versa actually uh, and yeah happy to. Uh, follow up and make sure that you know uh, commission uh, staff or know where those opportunities are and and if you, you know you're particularly interested in what we're doing as an administration um, happy to get more information on that as well great thank you i'm and, sure yeah. yes commissioner lou thank you uh deputy secretary uh, masavi thank you for the presentation i'd like to follow up on commissioner falcone's comment with regard to community involvement and decisions mm -hmm. about how to spend uh, 1.2 billion is it 700 uh, million of which or 70% or of which will be spent in the Port of Los Angeles and Port of Long Beach um, and this piggybacks a bit on our equity um, listening sessions mm -hmm. in which I, I don't think we did a sufficient job of hearing from the stakeholders who have concerns in the community uh, about port and freight issues so uh, it's going to be really important. I think that one of the best things you can do is, is simply get folks out and meet 
with the community members in those communities. Um, there are active community groups and dealing with port issues all up and down California. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd be happy to, to help if, if necessary, but I would recommend that you get out and meet with the communities and hear directly from them, which would be the most direct and uh, effective way of getting their feedback. Thank you, Commissioner Liu, very much appreciate that offer. I'm happy to follow up with our, our team on um, their engagement um, proposal and, 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 you know, who they've been talking to and, and, uh, yeah, if you see gaps in that, I'm more than happy to to reach out to folks and make sure we're reaching the right folks. Thank you. And I think anybody that comes up here to speak will probably hear that over and over again from us. Community outreach, community outreach, community outreach. <laughs> Any other questions, concerns? Okay, you're off the hook. Thank you. Thanks so much. Now, Caltrans Chief Deputy Director Mike Kiever. Yeah, thank you, Chair Eager. Um, Director Tavares is not able to make it, sends his regards, but a uh, pleasure to be here uh, to join you. Um, I wanna thank all of you that have expressed your condolences for uh, the loss of, of our, our employee, uh, Ali Shabazz, um, thank you. Um, if I could ask, uh, before I give the report, I, I'd, I'd like to start by saying a little bit more um, about the, uh, you know, Ali and the impacts that, that all of this has. And while I do that, I believe the next slide will have a, a, a picture of uh, Ali. There we go, thank you. And so, you know, it's been mentioned, so certainly it's just been a little over a week ago. Um, we got, a, you know, uh, District Director Gomez, uh, made a phone call to Director Tavares and, and, and myself, and it's, it's that phone call that you don't want to receive. Um, we were just at a commission meeting, as, as uh, uh, Commissioner Falcone mentioned, and we were just talking about the loss of Quanda McAdney, and uh, you know, an incredible uh, person and mother. And at that time, you may recall, uh, Secretary Oma Shakin and Director Tavares said, we hope that this is, is the last time. And here we are again at the very next meeting, and we have another another loss, and it's just very difficult to to describe uh, the grief and the dismay um, on so many levels that you know all these fatality elicits. Um, you know, we uh, you know it, it it does make you question what more you can do to 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 commit. Further to to do everything that uh, we can, uh, working together. Um, you know, at Caltrans, we talk a lot about the Caltrans family, and it's it's a real thing. And you know, because a lot of us, we we work together for a long, long time. We build these relationships, and um, you know, so this tragedies like this are are very difficult, and it and it hits you close, and. Um, and then you, you step back and you, you think, well, every, every tragedy like this, every fatality and serious injury, there are people that feel this, this pain, right? The, the, the people that are disrupted, the families that are disrupted. And it was mentioned, uh, Ali Shabazz, um, and I, I'm going to say some more about who he was. I want everybody to know. Um, but, you know, the father of eight, right, uh, a, a family, um, is impacted so much by by his loss, and and so you know with our role, our collective role uh, within you know transportation, so CalSTA, the Commission, Caltrans working together, um, you know we safety is and, and must be you know our, our highest consideration, and and I'll I'll talk a little bit more about some of the things that we're doing associated with that, but it just reinforces the importance of of what we're doing. And, and making sure that our policies and, and more important, our actions are, are going forward um, to do everything we can uh, to, to support the, a transportation network, to work toward our goals of uh, zero deaths and, and serious injuries. Um, 
you know, we, we now have 191 people that have died in the line of duty at, at, at Caltrans over, over the course of, you know, the department's history. And, you know, we, we thank the commission, your participation at our memorial, each May, very profound ceremony. Um, we remember none of them will be forgotten, um, but we certainly um, want to do everything we can uh, not just for, for the Caltrans family, but for everybody out there that we can create the safest system uh, possible. But, you know, the loss of 12 people a day on California's roadways just, just can't be normalized. And so, and I know all of us here feel that uh, deep inside, but this certainly drives it, uh, drives it home. But I, I want to say a little bit and want you all to know just, just who we lost. Um, you know, Ali's motto was live to love and, and love to live. And, and this will make some more sense as I talk a little bit more about him. So he and his wife, Nia, met in ninth grade at Edison High School. And they were inseparable from that time. And so they married right after high school. And then Ali graduated from Fresno State. He got his bachelor's degree in engineering, uh, married 31 years, eight children, three grandchildren. And um, his wife, Nia, shared that uh, Ali was, was very giving and charitable, almost, she said, almost to a fault. Um, he's very devout. He spent countless hours uh, at his community mosque. Uh, he rose to become uh, an imam in his Islamic faith. Um, he loved God and praying. He would always say a day that starts with prayer is a day worth living and to enhance his faith. He, he learned to read and write uh, Arabic in the Arabic language. And he, he didn't stop there. It wasn't, it was very selfless. Um, he began teaching Arabic to his community and held free weekly classes teaching Arabic, um, math, religion, and self-defense. And he wanted to increase um, the number of engineers and lawyers and doctors that come out of the Southwest Fresno community, right? And um, so he had a long-term vision of what he wanted to do as a person to help as many people as possible. And he actually had a 20-year plan that he won't be able to see through um, for the youth of his community. He's very youth-focused and in doing what he could. Ali began his work in design in, in 2006 at Caltrans. He transferred to construction. He was uh, very successful in his career as an assistant resident engineer on, on many uh, high profile construction projects. When contractors would um, request night work, you know, for a lot of our construction work is done at night, Ali would volunteer for those shifts, often so that he could spend more time with his community uh, particularly the children of his community during the day. Uh, during the pandemic, he took extra steps to ensure that the community was fed and clothed and set up food drives uh, for the community. And he and his wife noticed that um, many of the community children were falling behind in school during, uh, during the COVID pandemic. And they took it upon themselves to set up and even themselves teaching classes in their community center to help the children um, keep up. Uh, Ali encouraged all to give to charity. And for him, he had a saying, not only charity wasn't just money, he said a, a, a smile is charity. You can see Ali, um, you know, uh, all these pictures of him with that, that great big smile. And, and, you know, one of the people that he worked with, uh, Gerald Douglas in District 6, uh, said, you know, Ali had a, a good spirit, he, he loved his work, his family and his friends. He was just one of the kindest people in the department. And, and so certainly he will uh, truly be missed. And so I just wanna acknowledge we lost a good person and uh, through our actions, certainly wanna do everything we can to continue Ollie's legacy. Um, as you mentioned, uh, Chair Eager, you know, doing good works for our community. What, what can we do? And that includes, uh, you know, serving the people of, uh, of this state the best we possibly can. So uh, thank you for allowing me to say a few words about uh, Ali Shabazz and, and, and thank you for um, your comments on adjourning the meeting in, in his memory. So thank you so much.
Thank you so much for sharing that information with us. Uh, I think sometimes uh, we forget um, what effect people have on, on many, many, many lives. And so thank you for letting us know. And um, we, I, I realized after I saw the pictures that I had met with him mm. about training youth in South Fresno. Um, and we do have a, a plan to put some additional training in the neighborhood that he was talking about. Uh, so his legacy will carry on. It's wonderful to hear. Thank you. Thank you. And so there, there isn't really a, a good segue, um, but I, I would, uh, you know, again, appreciate the comments and, and I will try to give an abbreviated uh, report from here from Caltrans, but I do have the, the pleasure of, of providing an employee uh, highlight of two other individuals um, at Caltrans, uh, Brian Rubalcava and, and Jason Lofton. And, and you know, we're, we're very fortunate. Um, you know, Caltrans reflects the communities that we serve. We have people with, you know, tremendous heart and, and passion. And these are two individuals um, back in December of 2021. Uh, they're both maintenance workers uh, up in, in District 2. And they were doing rock patrol on State Route 263, and um, you know they noticed as they were doing that that uh, you know something appeared off. There was a, a patch of snow in the middle of a cleared roadway, and there were tracks that led off the road they could see through that snow. And they decided, let's let's stop. What you know is there something? And fortunately, they did. And so they pulled off in a safe place. Uh, they looked down the embankment and uh, they heard voices, somebody's yelling for help. They, they had a flashlight when they saw that the car had stopped. Um, uh, they, they immediately jumped into action. So, so Brian phoned for help in the truck. Uh, Jason rushed down the embankment to see what aid that he could provide. Uh, there were two individuals, they, they were hurt. Um, they were in shorts and in short sleeves and they uh, were suffering from major injuries and uh, sub-freezing temperatures because uh, again this is in December and so they gave them their, their winter work jackets and did their best to to try to comfort them and, and provide aid and the CHP arrived and and, and after that um, emergency responders um, and so they were able to uh, successfully get get help to them through their their keen eyes and their, their, their quick response and attentiveness. Uh, Brian's supervisor, Betty Booker, said she wasn't surprised one bit by his actions. Um, Brian is very conscientious about his job, a hard worker and, and always so proactive about public safety. He's a great employee and represents our department. Well, certainly would agree with that. Um, and Jason's supervisor, Roger Matthews, said that Jason puts the public first and always goes the extra mile. He gets along really well with his fellow co-workers and he's always willing to do anything I ask of him. And, and so I, I am happy to report that uh, both victim, uh, victims did have major injuries, uh, but they're both doing um, uh, much better. And uh, Brian and, and Jason, um, just very proud that you're part of the Caltrans family and, and we get to be associated uh, with, with individuals like you. And thank you for your commitment uh, uh, to uh, the important work that you do and, and the people that we serve. So very happy to report on, on their work. Next slide, please. So we were talking about, about safety and I we do have something good to report. So there was a, uh, a highway maintenance safety pilot that we have done uh, and we just completed the second year of the pilot, ended in June with some very positive uh, results. And the purpose of the pilot was for us to try to jumpstart to expedite uh, safety projects uh, through our highway maintenance program, which has a different um, delivery process and we're able to do simpler projects uh, fast, faster and at a good cost. And so, the pilot was funded for uh, $21.5 million for, for two years with a focus on three areas, 
uh, wrongway driver prevention, pedestrian safety, and curve warning upgrades. And with that money in those two fiscal years, we're able to fund safety enhancement installations at approximately 4,500 locations. And so that includes over 2,000 curve warning locations, over 1,500 crosswalk locations, and over 1,000 wrong way driver uh, locations. And so far, it, it exceeded our targets, uh, what we were able to do with those funds, and just a great example of the um, focus on safety and, and us leveraging every area of the department to try to do what we can to uh, enhance uh, safety on the, uh, on the system. Next slide, please. Uh, Undersecretary Masavi talked about this a little bit. Um, so the NEVI deployment plan was uh, developed in partnership with the uh, California Energy Commission and was submitted on August 1st to the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation for review um, for, for approval by uh, FHWA. Um, and the goal of the NEVI program is to establish a national network of publicly available electric vehicle fast chargers along designated alternative fuel corridors. So one prong of a multifaceted uh, effort to put the infrastructure in place for, for the transition to an, an electric transportation um, in our future. So we expect to receive approximately uh, $380 million in debit funds over five years. And the uh, Caltrans and Energy Commission uh, team will develop uh, grant funding opportunities for the program with additional uh, stakeholder uh, engagement to come from here. So it's, it's uh, launched and on its way. Next slide, please. I also wanted to mention our uh, second uh, DBE summit in, that was held in uh, Inglewood, California. So uh, Caltrans uh, acknowledges that communities of color and underserved communities experience fewer benefits and a greater share of negative impacts associated with our state's transportation system. We also recognize our role and, and obligation uh, in state government to eliminate barriers to provide more equitable transportation and participation uh, for, all, for all Californians. And so with uh, the Caltrans Office of Civil Rights as our lead, uh, Caltrans is committed to supporting socially and eco economically disadvantaged uh, small business participation in Caltrans projects. Uh, and, and that includes through public engagement. And so on June 21st, uh, there was an event held at, at Sof SoFi Stadium uh, in Inglewood uh, with over 700 firms registered. Uh, 250 people approximately showed up in person and, and over 400 participated uh, virtually. And it included a DBE listening session, uh, training on DBE certification, workshops on bonding and insurance, and how to work with Caltrans and other local agencies. We were able to partner with the city of Inglewood, with LA Metro, LA County Public Works, uh, in hosting the event and uh, uh, excellent opportunity to engage uh, potential partners in local communities and, and uh, demonstrate our commitment and provide opportunities and connections and, and information uh, to try to increase uh, participation um, in all the work that we're doing with our disadvantaged and small business uh, uh, community. So, uh, through June of 2022, uh, Caltrans, uh, 260 contracts, uh, over $2 billion. And this is measured over a federal fiscal year because the federal DBE uh, program, uh, we have a, a DBE goal of 22.2%. And through June, uh, we're, we're currently awarding 21.75% uh, of our uh, meeting our goal at 21.75%. So we're not there, but um, we're getting there. And so happy to report progress, but there's still a lot more to, to go. So, and then uh, last area uh, that I'd like to speak about and uh, next slide, please. 
So I want to talk about the Panther Creek Bridge replacement, and, and certainly as a bridge engineer, this is a uh, um, an interesting technical feat in this project. But but that's not really what I want to focus on. Um, this project is uh, in, located within the Yurok Reservation, and it's over a very sensitive fish rookery in the North Coast up in in District One. And uh, Panther Panther Creek is a critical fish habitat for uh, several threatened and endangered species, including coho and Chinook sa uh, salmon. And so the fisheries are also very central to the Yurok tribe and, and their culture. And so Caltrans staff coordinated um, with the tribe through the project delivery process, holding uh, at times quarterly or monthly uh, meetings, performing fish surveys, uh, looking at ways to minimize impacts to the waterway, and came up with this uh, arch design to avoid putting any uh, any columns or having any any construction uh, in the creek. Uh, Caltrans continues to partner with the tribe during construction, and uh, tribal monitors are on site uh, for the duration of the project. And so, the bridge is the first of its kind with a tight arch design, and uh, steel members uh, the corrosion protection is meant to be a lifetime protection to avoid any sort of painting or paint removal or anything over this uh, important uh, fish rookery. And um, in, in working uh, together, um, also able to include a separated bike and, and pedestrian path on the, uh, on the new bridge. It'll include a tribal motif uh, on the bridge rail and then in addition, and I want to thank the Caltrans uh, staff able to do this. So a separate project through a director's order will include broadband facilities that'll be put on the bridge now as part of this project that'll tie into the broadband uh, middle mile network, which will be discussed at a future uh, agenda item later uh, at this meeting uh, to provide equitable, equitable access to high speed broadband service and prioritize inclusion of underserved populations and tribal entities. And that'll include uh, internet service to the tribal office where um, cell phone service currently is essentially non-existent. And so we can see the direct benefits of, of the type of work that we're doing. And so very, very proud of this project. And um, thank you, uh, Chair Eager and Commission. That concludes my report. Thank you. I did have one quick question about the NEVI report. So does it include um, hydrogen um, infrastructure also, or is it just electric? I believe these are focused on electric uh, fast charges along the um, uh, the uh, priority corridors that uh, that we have, but it's part of a multifaceted overall uh, plan that we're working with the Energy Commission. So this is just one funding stream mm -hmm. amongst uh, a larger um, multiple areas of, of of funding, and we will be uh, looking at investing in in both hydrogen and electric overall. And I, I didn't get a chance to mention, we also brought uh, on board and, and get a chance to talk about it at a, at a future commission meeting, um, a new member of our sustainability uh, group that uh, is, is going to be focused on um, alternative uh, fuel in Good. particular. So we, we continue to expand our, our capabilities in that area. Thank you. Any other questions? If I could just add really quickly, Chair Eager. Sorry, right here. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more about hydrogen and some of the things that we're talking about from the dais from Hannah Walters on our staff under our SB 671 update as well. Hydrogen's being dealt with through the hydrogen hub process where this $8 billion, I think, federal investment and, and development of hydrogen throughout the country. And uh, also at the workshop yesterday, I learned or was reminded of, of the issue of DBEs and sometimes the contracts not being fulfilled um, and you know people using them to get their contracts and then not paying them in the end. So enforcement, contract enforcement, other type of training to make sure that, that these entities actually, um, that, that the, the people who are using them get actually fulfill the contract and requirements would probably be good to have in, in those, those workshops. I think it sound, sounded so yesterday from what I learned at our, our workshop with, with Caltrans folks. Yes, Commissioner Davis. So in the workshop in Inglewood, um, you know, the outreach to 
those that are trying to get into the contractor community, as Commissioner who just mentioned, uh, the bonding is typically what we see as the issue that keeps most mm -hmm. folks out. So whatever can be done to come up with a subsidized program to help, um, but, I mean, we, we have them through our organization. Got to sign a union agreement. A lot of people don't want to do that. Um, don't understand why, but that's a different conversation for a different day. But those are that that would be a big area that would draw uh, more potential employers in, so that the goals aren't goals; they're realities in these contracts. So, yeah, thank you, Commissioner Davis, and and certainly make a note of that. And I will say there were direct conversations and sidebar conversations on that issue at at the. Uh, at the SoFi event, but also subsequent uh, to that. So Perfect. it is Thank an you. area that we're looking into. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Commissioner Martinez. Uh, one of my condolences to the Caltrans family and to Lee's um, family. Um, you know, every meeting that we're at, it seems that. Uh, had fatalities and it's not easy to um, swallow. Um, certainly I understand from the Caltrans family and or just from uh, families period throughout the state of California. And when we talk about our roads and uh, one thing that is clear is that um, you know, we can't regulate our way to safety. We have to change the design of our roads. We can't simply put up speed signs and or try to reduce uh, speed. Uh, we have to change the, the, the design. And um, many of us in this room, um, including um, you all at Caltrans, have the power to do that. Um, and it's time. Uh, we, we can't look at volume, look at speed, and then trying to figure out how we can make these roads safe. It's just it's not compatible. And we tend to focus on speed and volume to get through our roads. But when you put up the pictures and you see faces uh, constantly, um, and, and most recent of, of my good friend, Supervisor Carmen Ramirez, um, it's heartbreaking because not only did she advocate her career to safety, uh, my 12 years of office, uh, I was elected, I was bullish on trying to change the dynamics of how could we move from just reducing some speed and putting some signs or enforcement We've been doing that for 20, 30 years. It's not working. It's not working. Children are dying. Couch, adults are dying. If this was happening on an airplane, the amount of pedestrians or folks that are in vehicles there are dying, uh, we would be having a different kind of conversation. And so at what point in time are we going to start having that real conversation about d designing our roads differently to put safety first for all users on our roads? And so I would just ask of you, Mike, of what else can we do is to, uh, I would say that uh, the first thing that we can do is figuring out what can we and you all at Caltrans do to, to reimagine what road design can be uh, not just in our highways, not just in our arterials, but our collector streets as well, because we're starting to see a huge um, um, accident, um, um, specifically for pedestrians and cyclists in our in our arterials. Um, and um, those arterials have become very dangerous uh, because we're trying to get volume. And um, as we're trying to focus on active transportation and trying to focus on transit and getting more people to use buses, we have to do things a little different. And so I'm just gonna urge 
our cells up here, Caltrans, Calsta, the state legislature, uh, the entire uh, family here uh, uh, within government in California uh, to really start focusing on road design and making real substantial changes to save people's lives. Um, it, it's time. Um, because we continue to have the same conversation over and over again. And I have to tell you that uh, uh, these two past uh, fatalities have hit me uh, really hard. And I will say that if I have to mention this at every meeting, I will. Um, uh, because uh, to look at the families that are suffering when some of these accidents could have been prevented, these fatalities could have been prevented. And so, Madam Chair, I just uh, want to thank you for, um, and thank you all for indulging me. Um, it's not a very easy subject for me, uh, especially these past couple of days. Uh, but I, I would just urge you, Mike and, uh, and, uh, and Director Tavares, uh, to figuring out, to take a leadership role uh, uh, at, at the state level to help those at the local level as well and embrace the changes that many uh, advocates and cities who are wanting to make change to make their communities safer, that um, Caltrans and Calsta and others can embrace uh, that. Thank you. If I may, just a very brief response. So, so Commissioner Martinez, thank you. Uh, I agree with you. We um, Changes are need to be made and um, you know, we'll continue to report on, on the efforts at, um, right before he left, moving from being Director Omashakin to Secretary Omashakin. Yeah. Uh, he signed a, a, a major policy change for Caltrans to implement the safe systems approach. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an approach advocated by FHWA as well. We and other DOTs are, are uh, uh, are making that uh, commitment to create a, a, a multi-pronged approach to improving safety. So it includes the design, it includes the um, you know behaviors, it includes you know creating opportunities for uh, you know a, a forgiving environment. It includes enforcement, includes all the different elements to to try to find ways to. Um, First, let's stop seeing increases in the fatalities and serious injuries, and then driving down to our goal of, of zero, right? So agree with you uh, completely and appreciate the efforts in working with the commission, uh, working with FHWA, working uh, with agency and, and Secretary Omashakin uh, to continue to um, uh, move that forward. And, and as I mentioned uh, when I was talking about uh, uh, the loss of Ali Shabazz. It's great that we have a policy that's the actions and in, in, in taking those actions. So thank you. Thank you. And I, I know when we were in Washington, D.C. Uh, not too long ago, and we heard uh, Secretary Omashakin talking about how transportation is not about roads, it's about people, and about it has to be about safety and what we can do differently. So I know we're all working towards the same goal. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, yes. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, first off, thank you to Commissioner Martinez for raising the issue again. Um, my my question is rather delicate, but is there any um, data on racial disparities when it comes to injuries, fatalities for Caltrans employees? Yeah, we we do um, have uh, data. We also um, you know work with. Um, you know, the investigative reports that come from the investigations that that, that take place uh, when there are injuries and fatalities. I, I can't cite the data, but um, I think many of us are, are aware there are racial disparities in in what we see. And so, um, certainly happy to to share that information with you, uh, Commissioner Grisby, and and the commission. But um, we do have information on. That. Sorry to chime in again, but and we piggyback on Commissioner Grigsby, uh, Grigsby that uh, if we would quit calling the, the, the deaths of the construction members that are employed by the contractors and your engineers that are on job sites that 
are killed inside those job sites as pedestrian with the Federal Highway Administration, that might help put a focus mm -hmm. on the fact that, um, they're, you know, they're, I mean, we're not going to be able to sort it out until we call it what it is and then try to figure out where it is. And I think that would be something that maybe, you know, Vince can help us work on um, as we try to figure out how we get to zero, because that's where we all want to get to. Thank you. Any other questions or concerns for Mike? Okay, thank you so much. So Vincent, unless everybody took all everything that you were gonna say. Yeah, <laughs> see you next time. That they just stick to their own area, right? So I'll talk about the DOT stuff and everybody else talk about their other stuff. I'm not unreasonable, I don't think. <laughs> I am unreasonable, but I don't mind being unreasonable. Uh, so just a couple of piggyback things. So uh, Mike, I'm glad you brought up the, the safe systems approach. I think that's something that was a big step for Caltrans. And I think uh, like you're talking about the, the issue is everything. It isn't any one thing, it's the collective of. Uh, and I think the safe systems approach is the type of thing that we're looking, we've been, we've been pushing the federal highway, Caltrans embraced it and ran with it. Um, and I think that's the opportunity that you're going to have to start changing your thought process. Um, and I appreciate Mike talking about all the pillars because it covers everything in the safe systems approach. So I think those are those are great um, things. And and that discussion on the pedestrian is happening. Um, what what we what we call pedestrian. Uh, the other thing I want to make sure we stop people don't call them are accidents because they're crashes. They're not accidents. Every all these things can there's. There's some way or another, either slow down a little bit more or, or maybe design a little bit, or, but these are not accidents, these are crashes. Uh, so I think that's, when I first moved to California, I heard that on the radio uh, and they said, crash. And I just thought, and I would, that same week I was having a strategic highway safety plan meeting and I <laughs> applauded the, that, the strategic highway safety plan team for having the radio station call it a crash because I thought, wow, good for you. You've got that message out that it's not an accident, it's a crash. Uh, so I, I, I thought that was a really uh, interesting little twist. Um, but uh, so thank you for the opportunity to talk. Uh, we stole Alyssa, I think that's already been covered. Uh, we're very <laughs> excited about that. Um, I've been getting, so Alyssa used to work for the Federal Highway Administration uh, a few years ago and she was our chief, chief financial officer for the Federal Highway Administration. So I've known Alyssa a long time, I was very excited to be able to get the opportunity to bring her to our team. So she's our chief deputy in the California division. So her jurisdiction is California. I've already had somebody in another state on the East Coast go, Vince, this is great. We, if we can get, I'm on this national team. I said, hey, slow your roll. She's California. All right, back off. Let's get her in California here for a little while. Um, but actually I'm, I'm very excited to have her in the team because she's gonna bring a different a different view for Federal Highway because she's worked on the other side of the fence uh, and I think it's really going to help my office and the Federal Highway Administration be better partners, be able to provide the the technical support that you're looking for and, and do the things that you need us to do to help deliver the program. So I'm very excited to have Alyssa. Alyssa, if you're listening, <laughs> that's a pretty big lift. Good luck. Um, <laughs> So we have a couple things that have already been covered. So we got that, 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 that. Okay, all those things have already been covered. Um, there's a notice of funding opportunity out for on closing on October 13th for reconnecting communities. So that's the discretionary grant process. So that is out now and on it closes on October 13th. Um, we've already talked about the greenhouse gas measures. We've talked about this. We've talked about that also. There's going to be a national truck co national coalition on truck parking coming up in September. So there's we've talked about goods movements and we've talked about truck parking is one of the biggest challenges in there. Um, so that's coming up in August. We don't have a I mean in September the date's not quite set yet for that, uh, but we'll make sure people know when that happens. Uh, I'm glad we had the discussion um, on DBEs. So the the DBEs, I, I continue to talk about when I first got here in 2008, 
we were in the two percent, maybe three percent. Uh, and then I remember when we were going to set this goal at 9% and, oh my gosh, there's no way we're ever going to get to that. Everybody was screaming. Uh, and Mike, you just mentioned the goal is at 22.5%. Uh, so I want to applaud everybody who's had an effort in that. And I think Mike and I have had the discussion a number of times. We're not anywhere where we would like to be. We're in a much better place than we've been. Um, the discussion about switching out contractors if a contractor commits that that is that gets addressed daily on every project there's a process that's set up for that there's repercussions if the contractor doesn't so there's a there's an entrenched process that addresses all of that um, Caltrans has a small business council that they meet with bi-monthly I think um, and they address so it's all small business and DBEs and veteran owned businesses and and they look at different things that that are challenges for that community to figure out what ways that Caltrans can shape the way they deliver the program. Um, there's a lot of things that have come out of that, things like breaking up projects into smaller size projects. I know, um, I think you're I'm blanking on your director's orders your, that, that are state funded. Some of those are all DBE or small business, I'm sorry, minor Bs. Minor bees are all small business. Those, those are all go to small business. So there's been a lot of stuff that goes on. Um, there's a couple of different committees I'll draw your attention to. The Native American Advisory Committee is another one. There was just a meeting with the uh, Native American Advisory Committee a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I applaud Caltrans all the time on that one because I, I appears around the country. Uh, we have 109 federally recognized tribes here in California, um, and many are represented on this Native American Advisory Committee. Uh, and there's a lot of things that happen with that. And I really, I, I, I was enjoying the discussion uh, of the Yurok tribe. Uh, so I know you don't do a project like that without great involvement, great consultation, and just sitting down and understanding the challenges. Um, so when you're dealing with tribes, which is another thing I keep, you hear me talk about a lot is tribes, tribes, tribes. Tribes need to be at the table. They shouldn't be handed something to comment. They should be at the table developing it. And a project like that clearly was a, let's sit down and talk about what our challenge is and let's figure out the best way to do it. So that's a great example um, of, of just working together. So I applaud uh, Caltrans. I applaud the Yurok tribe too, because that's a risk also that the tribes take. So uh, there's a lot of great coordination in California. Uh, and again, I think Caltrans would be the first to say we can do better. Uh, but there's been a lot of big steps in that area too. So wanted to just point out a couple of those. And let's see, I took Alyssa. Uh, oh, August redistribution. So we've uh, asked for, California has asked for, talked about August redistribution at the end of the year. So we get down to August. And if there's federal programs that haven't been fully spent, so it, like the TIFIA program or a couple others where they haven't, you know, every state is using all of their dollars, but then there's this, there's some other programs, some discretionary money. So we asked the states, hey, what do you need? You want more? Uh, California, I think last year was over 400 million. We got last year, which is more than, I think more than 19 or 20 states get over on their whole year. Um, I'm anticipating a little bit more this year, I'm hoping. Um, but I want to I want to thank Fardad Falak Farsa for the work that he did on that Stephen Keck's team that uh, we had some last minute requests and uh, and I know he was working on it and it, you know he got a call from me he's like Vince wait you're not supposed to call me um, but uh, I really appreciate his effort and his understanding of all the different pots of money so it isn't just hey here's money you know when you look at all your free distribution. You, you're going to say, hey, so we get every year we get our allocation, which is, you know, this much money in this program, this much money in this program like that. All that adds up to one big number. And then you get your limitation, which is a little bit less than that. So you can spend all this money in this program and this program and this program, but you got to stay under the bit this. The lower number that we're going to have to drop this program a little bit. So Fardad was really trying to juggle all of those to, to maximize the amount of money that you can get in August redistribution. So that's a, a quite the challenge. And I know some states were asking for $75 million um, and Caltrans is over 600 million when they ask for it. So it's really kind of big states 
I know of at least one big state that asked for just a little over 100 million. Uh, so I, I congratulate uh, everybody here in California being ready for, for August redistribution. Uh, and the last thing I want to draw your attention to, I've talked every time about the our Federal Highway website, check the Google machine, look up the uh, Federal Highway. Uh, there's a link on there for IIJA, and it's got all of the funding opportunities, all the latest fact sheets, all of those types of things. I also want to draw your attention to the DOT, Federal DOT's website. They have a, a thing called the DOT Navigator. So on the Federal DOT's website, talked about IAJ, but there's also this on there, and that link, do some searching, it's called the DOT Navigator. And there's three spots on that DOT Navigator. One's applying for grants, one's finding technical assistance resources, and the other is learning about the law. So there's opportunities for, if you're a, a local agency trying to apply for grants, there's opportunities for resources there through the D, federal DOT. So I just wanna remind people of that website, there's constant information coming up, new information that's happening, but that's also where you can find some resources too. And I think, I'm sure that I missed something. That's all I got. And I did get us back on schedule, I think. Thank you, we appreciate that. <laughs> Any questions for me? Yes, I think you me? missed that, that uh, California stole Steve Cliff back. You did, that's right. That is, that is. <laughs> Steve Cliff came back from uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and now he's with California Air Resource Board, right? So, yeah, very excited for him. Mila. Thanks for your update, Vince. Really quick, um, on the pilot... Um, Reconnecting Connecting communities, pilot. yeah. So, so where can where can uh, uh, projects apply? So, right, you go to that website, go to our um, federal highway website, and there's a link right there on how to apply for those. In the notice of funding opportunity, it's got a link to the notice of funding opportunity that was in the federal register, mm -hmm. and it tells you right where to go. Got it. Thank you. I, I, it's probably some long, big, strong out thing that ends in DOT. Right. <laughs> got it. Thanks. Okay, thank All you right. so much. Thank you. Ryan Niblock with Regional Agencies Moderator. Yes, Regional Agencies Moderator. <laughs> good afternoon, Ryan. Good afternoon, good afternoon, uh, Chair Eager and uh, members of the commission. Uh, so my name's Ryan Cordero Niblock. I'm with the San Joaquin Council of Governments and uh, the San Joaquin Valley. And uh, I'm serving as this year's Regional Moderator. Uh, so we had our August RTPA meeting earlier this morning, and I wanted to share uh, what the discussion was about today. Uh, first, an expression of gratitude to Commission staff uh, on the job well done on the SB1 guidance. Um, we know that staff offered over 23 workshops uh, for us to participate in and provide feedback, and overall the RTPA group saw it as a very uh, collaborative and and uh, a collaborative and transparent process. Um, commission staff even held office hours for this program and others, um, which allowed us to kind of work at the at the project level and also to get a better understanding of where the commission's taking the programs in general. So we appreciate that. And overall, the RTPA group just wants to express uh, support for the SB1 guidelines that are going to be uh, considered later today on the agenda. We also received uh, an IIJA budget update, uh, and we'll be working with Keith Duncan and local assistant staff to develop kind of a, a, a cheat sheet uh, that takes into account uh, the information that's available through uh, FHWA, as well as what we have in the state, so that we have kind of a one or a two pager uh, that we can share regionally and locally uh, that lays out the intended spirit of each funding program, uh, who's eligible to be applying, what does an eligible project look like, and what the really critical deadlines are. Um, we also received updates from Caltrans Division of Transportation Planning, where we had a very robust discussion on the Caltrans Strategic Investment Strategy. This is a very critical, uh, this is a very critically important document for project selection purposes at Caltrans, and many of our members expressed a desire to be able to provide more input on it. Uh, in particular, where we account for the special circumstances in rural areas uh, and understanding how projects like uh, roadways that are evacuation, fire evacuation routes, or 
projects that are safety focused or goods movement focused, how they're uh, evaluated in this sort of internal process. Um, many projects, as we know, require some sort of case by case evaluation. Um, so we know uh, from this conversation that Caltrans is going to be continuing the, the discussion with us. They're speaking at the Rural County Task Force uh, soon and are accepting comments from us. So we really appreciate the dialogue. Um, we also received an update from local assistance, Caltrans local assistance on the delivery of federal obligation authority. Uh, we're working with the state to bolster our numbers as much as possible before the end of the fiscal year. Um, but one concern was raised um, uh, related to the fact that we don't yet have all of the population-based apportionments for the current fes uh, federal fiscal year, which ends uh, September 30th. We've received the obligation authority, uh, but not all of the apportionment, and uh, we need that sort of straightened out so that we might be, be able to get more projects through the pipeline sooner. And we recognize that uh, IIJA creates new population category, and that this is something that's sort of out of out of the state's or out of Caltrans control. Uh, believe it, it's a Department of Finance uh, subject. So um, just sort of highlighting it as a challenge for us, uh, in hopes that uh, you know. Our Basically, to say we appreciate any any efforts in trying to help move this along uh, for whoever may be listening. Uh, and then, lastly, just an acknowledgement of <laughs> thanks. Um, lastly, we'd just like to acknowledge the project delivery workshop that was held yesterday uh, with the commission. We look forward to more of these sorts of opportunities uh, to hear uh, from the commission staff and 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 just to learn more about best practices occurring statewide. That, that's those are my remarks. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any questions? Okay, thank you, Ryan. Well done. I think we're going virtual now with Nafili. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I am Nafili Barrett, chair of the Rural Counties Task Force and executive director of the Mendocino Council of Governments. So the Rural Counties Task Force last met on July 15th. At that meeting, we received reports from several CTC and Caltrans staff members and discussed a wide range of issues facing our 26 rural counties, including <coughs> proposed legislation, the state budget, and the Interregional Transportation Strategic Plan Addendum. Our rural agencies appreciate the deeper dive that the addendum provided into the needs around the interregional corridors and will be reviewing the recently released draft. We also discussed the 2022 interim Caltrans strategic investment strategy that defines the Caltrans criteria for selecting projects for nomination and consideration for funding partnerships. One of our major concerns is that the interim CSIS was developed internally without the collaboration and input of the RTPA and MPO partners. In addition, concerns have been expressed that the criteria in the document are inconsistent with CAPTI and don't necessarily align with SB1 program guidelines. RCTF member agencies are concerned that the scoring rubric and criteria could disadvantage investment in rural regions. We're working with Caltrans on this issue and we hope to have a more in-depth discussion with them at our next meeting in September. We also received updates from the CTC staff on the SB1 competitive programs. As always, we appreciate CTC staff's efforts to include rural regions in the development process for these critical programs. Our CTF and its member agencies have been actively engaged in the inclusive and extensive process for development of the guidelines that are proposed for adoption today. Our members rely on competitive programs to deliver a variety of critical projects that we wouldn't otherwise be able to fund with the very limited amount of formula funding that rural agencies receive. Projects funded by these programs benefit not only our rural regions, but people and goods movement from all over California and beyond traveling to and through our regions. We support adoption of the guidelines today. On August 4th, we co-hosted the Sustainable Rural Transportation Solutions Summit in collaboration with CALSTA to explore and discuss implementation of CAPTI in a rural setting. The summit was well attended by staff from regional and local agencies, as well as state agencies, including the CTC. It included presentations from panelists on a variety of CAPTI aligned projects that have been implemented in rural and small urban settings and discussion based breakout sessions to explore challenges to implementation and future actions to address these challenges. Thank you to Darwin and to Emily Abrahams and the rest of the CALSTA team that worked on that effort. 
We expect to coordinate with CALSTA on follow-up conversations stemming from this summit and appreciate their engagement with the rural counties. And that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Okay, thank you so much. All right, thank you. And we have Keith Dunn from Self-Help Counties Coalition. Do we have Keith Dunn? Madam Chair, he was on. We're gonna to try to find him again. Okay. Keith, you should be good now. Keith, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Uh, Keith Dunn, Self-Help Counties Coalition. I will be brief, all is well on Self-Help County land. We're working on, I'd hope to have it by this meeting, a document that will show the multiple modal investments that all 25 counties are making. It was mentioned by VTA at the start of this. I think you'll find that all counties have that much of a diverse investment in their systems. We support an equitable climate resilient future and working towards that measure to partner with the state to implement those things. I am looking forward to seeing all of you at the Focus on the Future conference, November 15th and 16th in Newport Beach. And with that, I'll conclude my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Do we have any questions for Keith? All right, Keith, carry on wherever you're going. <laughs> Next, we have Sequoia uh, for an update on statewide equity listening sessions. There you are. <laughs> I'm looking <laughs> over here. You're not there. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, blew down. Um, I will have remarks um, starting with Jeannie Ward Waller and some of our CBO partners um, that we've worked with throughout the listening sessions and I'll turn it to Jeannie to introduce everyone. Thanks. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay, good. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I am going to just give a very brief update to you on the status of the listening sessions because I wanna give most of my time to our partners that I'm gonna introduce in just a minute. Very excited that we have completed um, five of our six geographically focused um, region listening sessions. We had really good turnout at each of them um, from community members as well as you all and other agency um, executives, commissioners, and staff. Um, just as a reminder, and I think this may be Commissioner Lugo's first time hearing about the listening sessions, um, the vision for these sessions is to allow people to share their personal stories about the impacts of the transportation system on them as individuals and on the communities in which they live. Um, so just to recap, since the last update I gave to you in May, we've held sessions in the LA Portside region, in the Imperial Valley and the East Bay. The LA Portside session took place as a two-part session um, on June 18th and 15th. The session was conducted in partnership with LA Walks and the Safe Street Promotora educators. The Imperial Valley session was held as part of the AB 617 Community Steering Committee meeting on June 8th. So we did two sessions on June 8th um, with different communities. That session was conducted in partnership with Comite Civico del Valle. And finally, our East Bay session was held in person. It was wonderful to be able to do one of these in person on July 13th and was conducted in partnership with Groundwork Richmond. Um, we do have a summary of the session format, community participation and key themes from the sessions we've done so far available online. Um, and our final session is coming up. This will be with the Inland Empire. Um, it's also planned as a two-part series and that is scheduled for August 24th and 31st. Um, so very pleased to have made it so far in this effort. Um, so we're entering the final phase of this work, um, at least in this first round of listening sessions that we're doing with our consultants ICF and our consultants as well as the Staff team are working on the final report um, that will inform Caltrans, CTC, and CalSTA towards implementation of equity-oriented change. Um, we're really looking for that to include 
actionable steps to strengthen our work both internally and externally. Um, and of course, we are also committed to follow up with the communities um, to ensure that we are all accountable to continue and engage with the communities where we've done listening sessions. Um, so as we wrap up the listening sessions, we've asked a couple of our CBO partners to join us for the next several commission meetings and share their takeaways from the sessions as well as our collaboration with them. Um, so we have two CBOs with us here today, Groundwork Richmond, who partnered with us to hold the East Bay session, and the Center for Race, Poverty, and the Environment, who partnered with us to conduct the session in Kern County. Um, and we anticipate having additional CBOs with us at the October and December commission meetings coming up. So first, I'd like to introduce um, Lorena Castillo, co-executive director, and Je Jessica Duncan, program manager for Groundwork Richmond. Um, they'll go first, and we'll be followed by Caroline Farrell, executive director for the Center of Race, Poverty, and the Environment. So I think I'm going to turn it over to Lorena, if you're there. Yes, good afternoon, commissioners. This is uh, Lorena Castillo. I'm the co-executive director of Groundwork Richmond. Thank you for having us here today and um, sharing some of the feedback and some of the highlights from our in-person listening session that occurred um, last month. And so um, just real quick, I wanted to say that um, for the most part, I thought the listening session was really well attended by community members. And some of the feedback that was heard across the board was uh, issues with accessibility, safety and affordability for transportation. And um, overall, our outreach efforts, I feel were successful. I would have wished we had a little more time to do canvassing and outreach in our communities. But, um, you know, with the little time that we had, we had a good turn up, good uh, turn up from the community. And um, in conclusion, I would just like to say that Towards the end of the listening session, I wish we would have had maybe um, some kind of opportunity for residents to have a follow-up for this event. Um, there was a lot of momentum and a lot of really good feedback being, being had by community members. And so I think it would have been um, really valuable to have like maybe another event or something else planned that the community could be um, looking forward to uh, for you know for the future months or so but other than that I, I was um, I was really pleased with the overall turnout and the feedback that we received thank you and I'll pass it over to my colleague Jess Duncan thank you hi everyone I'm Jess Duncan program manager at Groundwork Richmond thank you for providing us this space and this platform just to kind of share our experience with working with Caltrans. Um, our colleague, Megan Lamb, did a lot of the uh, organizing I was supporting as well, um, but she's on uh, her honey or um, um, marriage uh, anniversary right now. So, um, but I just really, really enjoyed working with Carolyn. Um, she had really great communication overall just a really great experience um i would say in terms of feedback for next time i think it would have been really helpful to know what, what the um, questions are uh, that we're going to be asked to the community before doing outreach just so could it could be a little bit more targeted uh, just because it was kind of a really broad ask um, so just a little bit more targeted uh, kind of understanding of what to just help us with the outreach that we do. Um, and then I know that this has to go through a couple, you know, uh, various probably departments, um, but there were, the timing sometimes, the turnaround uh, could have been improved just a little bit in terms of getting like flyers out a little bit sooner so that we could um, have more time to canvas like Lorena said. Um, but yeah, just kind of piggybacking on what Lorena mentioned from the community members, um, things that uh, there was big safety concerns, especially with uh, BIPOC communities and then also women, um, kind of leading into a lack of trust with BART police. 
Um, also, it, specifically in Richmond, there's a lot of bus stops that have been canceled completely, leaving a lot of residents um, kind of stranded. Um, there's also uh, people discussed how long it takes to take public transportation um, and, you know, saying that we, uh, if they were able to get a, a ride or something, uh, it would take maybe 20 minutes versus like an hour um, sometimes. And then not only that, but you do have to account for the detours um that the buses have to go through and especially for young people we work with young people a lot um, who did attend this session um one of which was a student discussed how you know she um wasn't able to sometimes getting to class on time was a struggle um because of these detours or just because of um delays in public transportation uh, also, unused real estate, so specifically right by the BART station, Amtrak station, uh, there's like a huge parking lot that's not being used. Um, not enough locations for public transportation where it actually goes, not enough routes. Uh, there, it, There's a kind of lack of marketing for rideshare options. I think the city of Richmond does have a rideshare option. So you know, the marketing hasn't been very um, well developed for that. Um, also, uh, there's a lack of like e-bikes and scooters. There's no scooters um, and uh, or e-bikes right now in Richmond. Um, and there used to be um, some gotcha bikes, uh, which are bikes that you can rent, um, but they are completely uh, I guess they were bankrupt or something, and now they're just kind of left in Richmond um, un unusable. Um, but just generally, uh, I think people really enjoyed being like having their voices heard. Um, one thing in particular, you know, we were out there uh, before the event started, and we were speaking with a, a woman who you know, an elderly woman who um, uses public transportation all the time, a Spanish speaker, and she really wanted to join, but, you know, she really also wanted to go home and, and eat dinner. So I think, you know, this kind of brings me to the next point of like moving forward. Um, should we partner with CTC or should we partner with Caltrans again? Um, it would be great to, you know, um, be able to have some, option different options for people to provide their feedback maybe in the way of surveys like a qr code where you know we could just connect with people right before and they can put a you know some of their feedback in there it doesn't have to be um you know a, a like long survey um but yeah just different methods diverse methods in terms of how we're um getting feedback from the community because um a lot of them just were really you know just kind of based on the um, uh, the conversations that were happening during this session, uh, you could tell people were just happy um, to have the opportunity to just discuss, you know, um, some of the frustrations and, and the concerns and also to share their stories, right? The stories of, um, of their safety um, being jeopardized. And that's, you know, that's some, that's a theme also that I'm hearing uh, while I've been on this call um, as just, um, unfortunately, lives that have been taken due to, um, uh, you know, public transportation or transportation related issues. Um, so just to kind of wrap up, um, yeah, like Lorena said, uh, having other opportunities for debriefing sessions um, is something Carolyn and Sequoia um, and us discussed um, before meeting today. And then, um, and uh yeah that's that's pretty much it um but thank you again so much for uh the opportunity and it was uh it was really really interesting um and a really great uh experience to be able um to work with um, with caltrans in this capacity thank you thank you do we have any questions for Lorena or Jessica? And you have Caroline that will be next. Hey, yes, good afternoon. 
my name is Caroline Farrell, and I'm uh, with the Center on Race, Poverty, and the Environment. We're based in Delano, California, in Kern County. Um, and uh, we were uh, fortunate to participate in, I think, the first listening session. Um, and I think just, to, and we appreciate the opportunity to, to share a few of our thoughts today. Um, first, we really, I think, appreciated the fact that it was a, an open-ended listening session. It wasn't connected to any particular project. Um, and so therefore it was an opportunity to just provide information and feedback. The challenge of that is then what, what do you do next? Like what's the follow-up? And that can feel a little um, amorphous, but I think it's a good opportunity to get to know different regions of the state and connect with communities on the ground uh, apart from and outside of a particular process. Um, and that can hopefully inform future processes and provide information and background in context for pro projects going forward. Um, and then in terms of the planning process itself, I mean, it was really easy to work with Carolyn and the, the facilitators and the staff at CTC. We met several times in preparation um, and uh, we felt that we could really provide feedback on maybe the structure and the flow of the program. And in fact, as a result of our meetings, there was a lot of flexibility. Uh, we changed platforms from GoToMeeting to Zoom because that was the platform that the community residents we worked with were most familiar with. Um, there, we switched from having the facilitation done in English with Spanish translation to having the meeting conducted in Spanish with English translation, which I think is a really great dynamic to facilitate community participation. We work with primarily Spanish speaking um, communities in Kern County. Um, and so that was a, a real benefit to allow. Uh, and I also think it's a great opportunity for agency staff that may be not used to being on the receiving end of translation to experience that. I think it provides a different way of um, participating in a meeting and you can see and get uh, maybe empathize more with people who are in your meetings receiving translation and maybe the delay or the uh, kind of challenges of of participating in a meeting that's not in your the language that you speak uh, primarily. Um, and we really appreciated that flexibility and the fact that our feedback was able to change maybe how the meeting was done. And it seemed as though, and I think what was reiterated again and again, it was the approach was what would be easiest for communities to participate. And I think having a participant centered approach and making it as easy as possible for them to provide their comments, uh, I think made the meeting experience like really positive for the participants. And so as a result, communities really were able to share um, and felt comfortable doing so. And I think the themes, again, uh, I don't think, you know, were very surprising, but it was really around safety and accessibility and quality of, of roads, uh, particularly in rural areas um, in the county, um, but also around train crossings um, in rural areas as well. And that kind of road, train, intersection, and uh, safety around that came up quite frequently. Um, and I think in terms of like next steps, uh, you know, I think hearing back about what Caltrans has learned from the various listening sessions throughout the state, what common themes there may be, we've heard some of them as was mentioned today, um, and maybe what strategies Caltrans may be looking at uh, as a result of some of these uh, listening sessions. Um, but as a first step, this was really promising. Uh, we were thankful to be involved and look forward to following up in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Any questions? Yes, Commissioner Liu. Hi, Caroline, Joe Liu here. We go back a long way. Um, I would like you to comment on something that I think we need to pay close attention to. We're getting to the point now where we're forming um, a transportation equity advisory group. And we're gonna want long-term commitment 
from community members and, and other advocates and, and stakeholders to engage in a process on an ongoing basis. And we've got a little bit of a problem in that we would love to compensate them, but there are restrictions on us from doing that. Can you talk to the importance and need of groups like yours to have funding and other resources available to it so that it can engage effectively in the processes that we're trying to take on now with this ongoing commitment to equity? Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things uh, about this, this process was that there was a bit of money attached to it that helped us actually uh, compensate community members who helped us with outreach uh, in their communities. Um, you know, participating in, in government processes, whether you're a community member or a nonprofit equity or environmental justice organization, um, many of the grassroots groups or groups that are connected to community on the ground, I mean, we don't have big staff or big budget. And so if we're participating in, in advisory meetings, that means we're not doing something else. And so we either have to hire um, a, another staff person to take up the work that needs to be done, um, as well as compensating the person who is participating in the meetings. But also, you know, there may be times where we're reaching out to community members and maybe having a, a focus group. I know when when we participate, when our staff participates on community meetings, we try and follow up with the communities about, you know, what what has been happening in those meetings. And so that requires more staff time. It requires report back, um, analysis with the community to get feedback, to then take up to the advisory group on questions that are being asked. There's more work associated with it than just attending the meeting. Um, if you're connecting with groups that are actually have community residents that they're working with directly, there's, we often talk about the meetings after the meetings. Um, that are probably the most important and the most informative. Um, so while a, a meeting might only be like once a month or once every six months or however frequently you're doing it, there are meetings before it and after it to help prepare the person to be there. Um, so there are a lot of expenses in addition to like the travel time and just the, the redistribution of work that come up frequently. Um, plus, you want to value and compensate the community residents that are participating in your meetings as much as you, as much as you can. Um, so, I, I think those are some of the thoughts that I would offer on on that question. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Grisby. Uh, thank you. Uh, first off, just want to honor Carolyn, Jessica, Lorena for your great work uh, for the state of California. Um, I think my question might be more directed towards Jeannie. Uh, which would be a reminder for me of how are we going to uh, operationalize this actionable intelligence? Commissioner Grisby, that is an excellent question. Um, we are, um, you know, certainly want to honor all of the sessions. So um, we want to hear from our sixth session um, and, and create the space for that. Um, but we do, um, want that final report to contain some actionable items. I think probably the most important thing right off the bat is to commit to, you know, continuing to follow up with the communities where we've done these listening sessions. Um, and we did um, include our district directors and district staff, district planning staff to make sure they're engaged and that they can follow up. Um, that, you know, is probably the closest um, ongoing relationship that they are going to have to our state agencies is with those district staff that are embedded in the local communities and, and doing work on the state highway system. Um, but, um, you know, certainly our equity advisory committee, our, um, our equity index work, you know, the ongoing work that I think our three agencies are doing together are all key steps, um, actionable steps that um, will help us, you know, follow up and, and continue to engage in communities in the way we have done with these listening sessions. Um, so we wanna document that. We want to confirm with the communities that we have accurately documented um, what we heard from them. I think that's really important to close the loop. 
um, but also to make sure that you know in our in our processes going forward, our programs, um, projects, plans, guidelines, um, that there we are being mindful of the things that we've heard, um, and and continuing to engage communities in a re really meaningful way. Um, so I think you know this is really just that first step. Um, we want to do more listening sessions like this. So we've already talked about talked about more you know series that are similar and and maybe focused on different communities or different um, demographics. Um, but certainly um, welcome your comments and um, you know we we all need to be engaged in this and part of the process of identifying those action steps. So we look forward to bringing that back to you and having more discussion with you on that. If I could just jump in real quick, I think another important thing in terms of what we learn and how we take what we learn is the commission's annual report to the legislature and, and taking uh, what we learn and putting it in that. And then, um, as Jeannie mentioned, you know, how do we take what we learn and improve when we do this in the future? I mean, one of the things we heard a lot uh, was about uh, transit or about activities that aren't really under the commission's purview or under uh, um, under Caltrans's purview now, CalStep perhaps more so because they're the state's larger fund, largest funding funder of transit uh, capital programs, but then making sure we have our local partners at the table. Um, I think that's that's really something we, we, we need to be doing uh, next time around. And then as, as was mentioned in some of the presentations, how do we close the loop with people who took the time to talk to us to tell them, we heard you. We don't have the ability to to do you know to to, to make the improvements to, to to get to this, but we we can at least tell the people who who have policy making decision. We inform the legislature at least. Yeah, just for me, like um, I've used some of the products around transit in the Bay Area. Um, I've had to encounter some of the things they mentioned: um, people smoking fentanyl. Uh, various other things that should not be happening. So I just wonder how do we um, get to the point of solving those problems as soon as possible when the public knows that things are out of control or unsafety. And I think I might add too, I think we also heard from uh, the folks today is that we weren't able to reach enough people. So, you know, as we talk about what we do going forward um, to ensure that those next steps include um, continued community outreach and give them enough time to be able to to really reach out to folks who didn't have a chance to to tell us what they thought. Um, Commissioner Bradshaw, did you have a comment? Yeah, just real quick, I just want to say again, uh, thanks as well to Carolyn, Jessica, and Lorena for stepping up uh, for the community and uh, being the vehicle for voices from the community coming to us. And I just really appreciate citizens stepping up. Uh, and Jeannie, you may have mentioned this already, but and Mitch talked about it a bit, but really what I'm interested in, I was able to, blessed really, to be able to attend two of the equity listening sessions. Uh, very different geographies you may imagine, and you may think transportation needs are different. One was Imperial Valley, and then the most recent one I was able to attend was the East Bay. Um, but one of the things is when, when the report is done and what's the actionable items, I will say that a lot of things stood out, but to focus on the East Bay uh, listening session, a lot of issues uh, really, very just to be very blunt about it, uh, around class and around equity, around race, um, violence, safety, and again, uh, I think uh, Mitch talked about it a bit, what is under our purview and what is under our jurisdiction as the Transportation Commission. However, uh, I believe in the reports that we bring as we're engaged with our partners in these listening sessions, uh, how we can maybe review and bring those of us who sat in uh, what we heard and to make sure just most importantly that the people, the folks in the community that brought it up, that their voice is heard uh, and what's the next actionable step. But uh, I heard a lot about broken system connectivity, uh, can't use mass transit because of the safety, because of the crime, and uh, the um, experience, I'm not going to call it perception, I'm going to call it experience of folks uh, that I would agree with, that there is a different type of enforcement, different type of service uh, in local transportation uh, based in class and often based in race. And uh, it was loud and clear. Uh, again, I was honored to be there. and. 
participate and listen, but, and maybe I should know this, maybe because I'm new, but the next steps on the reports, what's the timeline on that? And then, uh, and then back to you, Mitch, a little bit, our report to the state that you talked about, how does this get incorporated in and how do commissioners, uh, be, are we able to review that, I would assume? Uh, sorry for all the questions from, uh, you know, online here, so to speak, which I was in person. Thank you. I, Commissioner Brunch, I appreciate all the questions and, and just appreciate how engaged all of you commissioners have been in this effort. I, I've just been incredibly impressed at, at the level of engagement and the time you've given. So I want to thank you for that and um, absolutely appreciate your questions. We are aiming to get that report um, to you by the end of October. Um, so hope, yeah, hope that we'll come in front of you. I imagine by then it'll be probably your December meeting. We'll, we'll certainly work with Sequoia and the team um, to figure out, you know, when we get that in front of you. Um, but it, yeah, there's going to be quite a bit in that. I think, as you said, you know, we heard such a wide variety of concerns, but very focused on, you know, transit dependent folks who really are using transit and are very unhappy with the level of service, the safety, the access, the convenience, all of those issues. So um, uh, it is part of our charge at Caltrans. We do have, you know, rail and transit division. We are thinking about how to make transit, you know, more modern, support operators around the state, um, making their service more accessible. And all of those buses, a lot of them, you know, operate on the state highway system. So there is a lot that we can do. Um, and we're thinking deeply about that um, as a Caltrans executive team and with our with our equity group as well. So um, we look forward to a lot more discussion on these issues as we as we get that report and talk about how to take it forward. So thank you. And if I may, just one more moment, I was remiss not thanking uh, Sequoia and the staff as well. Uh, really, really appreciate it. And one thing I should have mentioned as well is that the, uh, the safety of the operators and the workers in the transit systems, uh, whether it be rural or, or the uh, urban cores uh, came up as well. So just want to make sure that point was made. Thank you so much for your response. Thank you, Commissioner Bradshaw. Any other questions, comments? Sequoia, anything else from you? No, but I just really appreciate, you know, taking this time to, to dive deep into what was being shared and we'll have future um, reports from our other CBO partners, community-based organization partners. And um, this is really meaningful and, and thanks for having the space to share this level of testimony. Yes, thank you. It's very important. We, we do appreciate all the work that you do. We're going to take a break now, um, and we will be back at 3.35.
Okay, thank you. We are now back. We will move to Paul for the state and federal legislative matters. Paul, you are up. Thank you. Uh, tab 14 is an action item to accept the staff report on the status of state legislation and also to provide a delegated authority to staff, which I'll describe in a moment. Uh, but first, as brief background, the legislative session is almost at an end with just two weeks left. Both the policy and fiscal committees have finished their bill hearings, so remaining active bills for this session are now pending floor votes. Uh, there's a list of bills staff are continuing to monitor in your book item. The commission does not have a position on uh, any of these bills at this time. Given the commission will not meet again prior to the end of the legislative session, and bills could still undergo substantial amendments. Staff is requesting you delegate to the executive director upon consultation with the chair and the vice chair, the authority to take positions on legislation for the remainder of this year's legislative session. The commission has approved um, this type of delegated authority in prior years. Uh, and with that, staff recommends you approve this item. Thank you, Paul. Do we have any questions? Do we have a second? Our team is second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Madam Chair, who made the motion? Uh, Davis. Sorry. You're up again, Paul. Tab 15 is the regular informational update from Caltrans on uh, state budget issues and the utilization of funding capacity for our programs. And um, Keith Duncan is not available today, but I believe Stephen Keck, Chief Financial Officer of Caltrans, will present this item. Good afternoon, Chair and Commissioner Stephen Keck with Caltrans, uh, filling in for Keith, who is under the weather today and not able to present. So I have no notes other than what I hand wrote for this presentation. <laughs> and I have no answers to any tough questions, but I'll be happy to have Keith follow up with you at a later date. Um, now you've is, done it, you know. Now we're thinking of really tough questions to ask you. That's great. That's fantastic. Perfect timing <laughs> for that. Um, so this is a, a look at the very end of last fiscal year. This is that traditional look at how much uh, of the allocation capacity was allocated during that year. It, uh, it's something that Keith was updating you on each commission meeting. We did end the year just about 50% total allocations versus allocation capacity. Um, it's worth noting that in May, we added $500 million in capacity to the shop due to some emergency funding received from the feds. And then in June, we added uh, another, um, what was it, almost $900 million because of IIJA. So we did increase that amount as we were trying to allocate uh, towards projects in the end of the year at about 50%. Um, other notable programs include a 62% allocation uh, of the STIP, 17% of the TIRCP, although we did hear today that several more projects have been awarded at the agency level and will come to the commission very soon. 75% uh, LPP, 32% for SCCP, and 67 for TCEP. One thing that I know Keith has made clear, and I want to make sure everybody is very clear on, any capacity not used last fiscal year does roll into this fiscal year. It's not lost. It doesn't go away. So um, that money will be available for allocation in the current fiscal year. Uh, this is another chart that we've been going over each year. It shows um, how the allocation, allocations at each commission meeting stacked up against prior years. As you can see, um, delivery was a little bit behind where we were last year in terms of percentage of the overall uh, allocation capacity. Total allocations, however, were on par with last year. So we see a, um, a, a, um, a lower line there in the 21-22 in the green line. Um, but again, it's worth noting we had nearly a $1.5 billion increase in allocation capacity towards the end of the year. That accounts for um, not quite half of that gap between where we were last year and where we were, um, I'm sorry, where we were last year, which is that green line, and where we were the year before that. So not a great delivery year, but again, that capacity is not wasted. And I'll note that in your agenda today, 
We have uh, more than $2 billion in shop allocations up for consideration. And uh, I think there's a single book item with $1.7 billion in shop for construction and construction support. So a very good start to this fiscal year. Um, then another item that we've been tracking all year long is how did our estimates of revenue for our major taxes and fees compare to actual throughout the year? Um, I wouldn't get too used to this. <laughs> 1% is an absolutely fantastic uh, uh, estimate. This is, um, these are uncharted times. Remember, we're recovering from COVID still at this date. These estimates were made more than a year ago before the start of the 21-22 fiscal year. Uh, it looks like actuals came in just about 1% over uh, what was estimated. Very good, uh, little differences in some of the taxes, uh, but overall our tax uh, taxes have come in right on, on par with where we thought. So. Um, obviously, this means we don't need to make any uh, negative adjustments to our um, our allocation capacities, and it's really just a great place to be in. Uh, One percent is is exceptional. I, I again, I don't want to say we can't expect it every year, but it that that's about as good as it gets. Um, okay, so hold on to your socks if you have them. Uh, this is a look at the allocation capacity for the current fiscal year. So. Um, at the last commission meeting, Keith presented the estimated allocation capacity uh, for the current year. We call that the draft capacity. It's about $6 billion um, across all the programs based on their, their annual funding rates. Um, and then we have that rollover capacity that I highlighted at least twice now already. That's the unallocated capacity from last fiscal year is still available for allocation this year. That's about $4.9 billion in capacity that rolled over across all programs. And then we have a new line called adjustments. These represent the brand new allocations from the Budget Act of, um, uh, of just a month ago now. Um, that added in general fund funding, the very popular 1.05 billion for ATP that's allocated, I'm sorry, um, appropriated by the legislature for allocation and for programming and $3.65 billion in the TIRCP. So that added another 4.7 billion. Total capacity for allocation this year, 15.6 billion. I'm glad Keith's not here, I got to say that first. $15.6 billion for allocation this year, uh, a number that's never been seen before, truly a, a, a huge year, a daunting year. Um, we came off a year last year that, that we saw delivery was a little lower than we would have liked, we're starting out very strong this year with the $2 billion allocation for shop. Um, we have a tremendous program now with ATP, $1.6 billion available in capacity. We'll talk about uh, the programming of that and the fund estimate portion uh, later on in the agenda. Um, and then going a huge increase in TIRCP that's handled uh, through the state transportation agency. Um, final and with uh, where we are with next steps, Vince already mentioned August redistribution. We did request uh, quite a lot of money through uh, through August redistribution. That's an opportunity to receive some of those funds that weren't used uh, across the nation. Uh, as Vince noted this year, not states leaving money on table this year, but really some of those programs like TIFIA program where they didn't allocate all the money to, uh, to projects that is distributed to states and we get a piece of that. Um, hopefully a very large piece this year. And the federal year ends on September 30th. Um, and uh, it's worth noting that in October, a 12 month pause to the general fund portion of diesel sales tax uh, will take place. And that's part of the, um, the relief that was voted as part of the budget act. It's just the general fund piece of sales tax. It will not affect the, the piece of sales tax on diesel that, that funds transit for, um, for local state uh, local and state agencies. So only the general fund portion of that sales tax will be um, put on pause for 12 months starting in October. And with that, I'll end my presentation and happily defer any really tough questions to Keith when he comes back later. Thank you. Yes, Mitch. Uh, yeah, so as Mr. Keck noted, the, the 15 billion is, is a really big number. Um, one of the things that that we've been talking about internally and with with Steve and Steam is, um, do we need to provide some other information in this report in the future? One of the, one of the things that 
that we know with some of these funds, particularly with the, the general fund uh, funds, for example, with the ATP, we, we're just starting the programming cycle. So we know we're not going to have projects to allocate that right near right now. So in addition to knowing the allocation capacity, which is very important when we look at our ability to advance projects, or perhaps, a, you know, in other, some years it's been a need to delay projects. Uh, should we be looking at what is our expected level of allocation? Because we don't expect that whole one point whatever billion for ATP or the, you know, the four billion for, for transit and industrial rail capital program. We know that's not going to happen. So should we be comparing ourselves to what we actually expect to happen? Um, and so we'll uh, look forward to presenting something that's uh, that provides some greater context in the near future. Anyone else? Hey, thank you. I don't think you're going anywhere. The next is the adoption of the 2022 Trade Quarter Enhancement Program Fund Estimate Resolution G2251. It, yeah, commissioners, this is an action item. Uh, staff is recommending approval of the proposed fund estimate, which uh, Stephen Keck will present to you. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Again, Stephen Keck with Caltrans. Um, I'll be very brief on this presentation because I think we're running a little bit behind today. This was presented to you in draft form at the last commission meeting in June. Nothing has changed. These are the numbers. Uh, $1.06 billion over the, um, the three year period that is uh, included in the fund estimate. Again, no changes from what was discussed at the last meeting, which is why I just skipped over the assumptions. Those haven't changed. The dollars haven't changed. Here's your amount. I recommend along with your staff that you uh, approve the uh, fund estimate. Do we have any questions, comments? I'll entertain a motion. Second. That was uh, Commissioner Liu and Commissioner Davis. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we will move to Hannah. Yeah, good afternoon, commissioners. So I'm presenting the final trade quarter enhancement guidelines for your review and approval. There are five main changes that I'll focus on that we've made um, since the June meeting. And there are also some minor technical changes that I'll mention briefly. So first, uh, with help from Commissioner Davis and Commissioner Bradshaw, um, we developed training and certification language for contractors and subcontractors working on zero emission freight infrastructure. And we also got help from the California Workforce Development Board and the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Um, so we added that in, and one change that we plan on making um, to that language that's not posted in the version that goes with this book item is um, to add a clarifying language that says that in order to be eligible um, for program funding, contractors and subcontractors must not be found in willful violation of labor law. So we'll add that into the final version. Another thing we changed since June was in response to commissioner concerns about some of the federal language in the guidelines, staff removed this language and we added a new language clarifying our intent to maximize uh, federal investments wherever possible. We finalized definitions for zero emissions and near zero emissions uh, with help from the California Air Resources Board and the South Coast Air Quality Management District. We also added a section about public health. This is in response to the comments from the Coalition for Clean Air at the June meeting and also in response to a letter that we received from some climate advocates. Um, that letter is included as a part of this book item. And the public health language that we added, it points to metrics in the guidelines that uh, collect public health related information, such as air quality um, and safety um, and accessibility. And it also incorporates um, some research from Dr. Appleyard, who had done some public health research for us for SB1. And then we updated the total dollars available based on the most current fund estimate, which you just heard. 
so here's some, in addition, those are the main changes and those are all included in the guidelines that are part of this book item. In addition, there's some uh, minor technical changes that we intend to make to the final version. These include adding a definition of the word federalized on page nine, taking out the word port improvements as duplicative on page 10, adding clarifying language about eligible projects on page 10, adding language that NEPA clearance may be beneficial for project ratings on page 12, and changing the word sulfur dioxide to sulfur oxide. Thank you for pointing that out, Commissioner, and the guidelines. I knew you had to um, that. And so that, that's, those are all the changes. And I wanted to note that the guidelines are consistent with Article 19 of the California Constitution. Um, staff recommends approval of these guidelines. Thank you, Hannah. Um, do you have comments? Commissioner Davis? I would just make a motion to approve and thank Hannah and for, for all her work and her team's work. Second. Thank you. So we do have public comment. Uh, Patricia Chen from LA Metro. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners, and a special warm welcome to uh, Commissioner Lugo. I'm Patricia Chen with LA Metro. And um, our comments today are um, registered under item number 17, but they also apply to the remaining items through 22. Um, we wish to express our support for all the guidelines as well as the fund estimates. Um, we appreciate the fantastic job that the commission staff did um, on collaboration with the regional agencies. And I asked our um, program managers for some specifics to make these comments more weighty. They said that on TCEP, staff asked for input based on two cycles of experience. And they researched and really addressed the issues. And this uh, helped to build trust in the guidelines process. Uh, under SCCP, uh, it was just pretty much the amount and variety of input opportunities. Um, and I would say the office hours were really helpful for running through the projects as test cases for various parts of the guidelines. And finally, um, for LPP, we would echo these comments and um, add that things that were not broken were not fixed. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, <laughs> that was a great comment. Um, we also have Sophia, and I'm sorry, Sophia, I can't read your last name. Dear commissioners and CPC staff, my name is Sophia Rafikova. I'm the policy advocate with the Coalition for Clean Air. And we were able to comment on this item at the June CTC meeting, and we appreciate the CTC staff working with us in incorporating our suggestions. Uh, in particular, we're thankful for the expansion of the public health criteria to include the safety and air quality considerations, and to see this language added to the S other SB1 funding programs. However, not all of our concerns were addressed in the final version of the guidelines. The letter that we submitted on behalf of 10 environmental, transportation, and public health groups stated uh, as to the TSUB program considers its impacts on vehicle miles traveled. TSUB currently funds the highest amount of VMT increasing projects out of all SB1 funding programs um, due to its requirement to increase freight throughput. Yet if we are to reach the 22% VMT reduction goal in the CARB scoping plan and the GHD emission mandates required by SB32, all programs must do their part in promoting projects that reduce or mitigate VMT. While we understand that the goal of this program is to improve trade corridors with high freight volume, we ask that these improvements do not con contribute to an increase in passenger VMT. For example, constructing an additional lane in a trade corridor can increase both heavy duty and light duty traffic. Aside from increasing VMT, uh, studies have shown that uh, large diesel trucks are the greatest contributor of PM 2.5 emissions which can cause various cardiorespiratory diseases. A single unit truck and combination truck VMTs forecasted to increase by 101 
percent and 57 percent respectively by 2049 we ask that the cdc considers prioritizing projects that reduce freight vmt uh, by using measures such as investing in clean rail and building multimodal networks off the highway systems such measures will not only help us achieve climate and air quality mandates but it would also help reduce congestion contributing to trade corridor efficiency and we look forward to continuing to work with ctc staff on this issue thank you thank you do we have others virtually yes thank you chair we do have virtual attendees who are looking uh, to comment on this item uh, up first, we have a written submission from Kenneth Cow, who writes, I wanted to thank Commission staff for their broad and inclusive outreach on the development of this cycle's TCEP, STCP, and LPP guidelines. MTC staff supports the adoption of these guidelines, and the Bay Area looks forward to submitting nominations for these programs later this year. Uh, we also have a couple of attendees with their hand raised. Up first, we have Sandy Nerano. Sandy Naranjo, you are free to unmute yourself and comment. Thank you. Greetings, Chair and Commissioners. This is Sandy Naranjo, Policy Advocate for Climate Plan, a network of organizations dedicated to creating a healthier, sustainable California, where people of all backgr backgrounds and incomes have the opportunity to thrive. Climate Plan thanks the CTC for their work on updating TSEP guidelines to include zero emission infrastructure, community engagement, Protect, protection of natural and working lands and for acknowledging and listening to our concerns about the significance of including public health at the last June 2022 CTC hearing. We appreciate that the CTC included a section on the draft August 2022 TSEP guidelines to outline how public health is captured and considered in TSEP. Although it is pointed how public health is considered, it is important that there must be a public health criterion on helping promote funding of projects that protect the public health of communities who have been historically impacted by toxic pollution emitted from the freight sector. A public health criteria help prioritize the funding for projects that benefit public health and disqualify funding for projects that increase toxic air pollution. In addition to protecting public health, we want to make sure projects help align with our state targets on VMT reductions. As referenced in the coalition letter on TSEP guidelines submitted by advocates to the CTC back in June 2022, NRDC found that CTC spent 75% of $1 billion in the 2020 cycle on VMT increasing projects. There must be an inclusion in the role VMT plays within these projects to help assure that our funds are helping us meet our statewide climate goals. Again, we thank you for the work that was done and updating TSEP, and we look forward to working with you to strengthen TSEP funding guidelines that help align with our state's climate, health, and equity goals. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Do we have others? Yes. Up next, we have... Aaron Hoyt. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Appreciate this opportunity to speak today uh, before you, Commissioners. My name is Aaron Hoyt. I'm the Deputy Executive Director for the Nevada County Transportation Commission. And I want to commend you and your staff, as others have, on the development of these guidelines that are up for adoption today. Your staff uh, fostered an open and truly collaborative and transparent process with us throughout the entirety of the program. Um, this is really an amazing feat when considered the diversity of agencies who are at the table um, and stakeholders who really participate in the process to make it what it is. We were one of the agencies who took advantage of the office hours hosted by your staff, and this was truly beneficial, um, enabling a small agency such as ours to sit down and understand the expectations of the program, clarify some questions we had about it, and refine our project. So we uh, definitely thank you for that. We also view the TSET program as a valuable funding opportunity to improve goods movements in Nevada County that often uh, serves as a detour route for Interstate 80. Um, when traffic is closed on Interstate 80 and you have anywhere between four to $8 million per hour of goods that are transferred to State Route 49 in Nevada County. With that, I again, commend your job on a great, uh, your staff on a great job and uh, we support the adoption of these guidelines. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Are there any others? I see no other public comment at this time. Great, thank you. Commissioner Liu. Yes, thanks. Um, I'd just like to say, uh, big picture, these guidelines for TSEP are just um, much, much better than last cycle. So that improvement um, is a result of the hard work of our staff, and I, I really would like to appreciate and acknowledge um, those changes that were made and the hard work that went into them. 
I do think we're going to need Caltrans's help to make them just a little bit better for the next cycle. And let me explain. It's a bit of a rabbit hole uh, that I went down, but I was looking at the list of air pollutants in the performance metrics page. I'm like, wait a minute, there's only one greenhouse gas listed there, CO2. It's a really important one, but there are others. Why aren't the other ones listed? Anna nicely explains to me. Well, those reporting requirements are based on the Cal BC economic model and, and benefits and cost model. And Cal BC is dependent upon CARB's M fact, emission factor model. So if they're not in M fact, then they can't be in Cal BC. And so that sent me down a rabbit hole and Hannah too to figure out what's in Cal, what's in M fact and what can be in Cal BC so that we can have a, a more complete list of air pollutants reported as the performance metrics because there are other very important pollutants that are missing. And I found three. <laughs> um, there, are, there are two other greenhouse gases, um, nitrics, uh, nitric oxides and, uh, and methane that are not listed, but they are listed in MFAC. So all we got to do is convince Caltrans, I have an arm to twist here, um, <laughs> convince Caltrans to update the model and include those two greenhouse gas pollutants so that in the next cycle, and this might apply to other, you know, um, reporting requirements that we have for other pollutants and stuff, because we rely on this Cal BC model a lot. If we can include those in, update it. And then I discovered there was one more air pollutant that was added recently in 2021 to MFAC that is missing in Cal BC, and that is ammonia. Ammonia is a very important pollutant for a lot of reasons, but especially because it's a precursor to particulate matter. So I asked to add those three pollutants so that next time around we can add those in to our performance metrics and to other places where we, we track air pollutants. So thanks for going down my rabbit hole with me. Um, that's where I ended up in all of this. Uh, a very specific request of Caltrans to update that, that model uh, and incorporate all those different pollutants that are in the, uh, the ARB mobile source model. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Liu. Any other comments? So I just want to say one statement first and to reiterate what Commissioner Liu said. Um, obviously, Hannah, your team did a lot of work and we saw all of those changes as you talked about uh, the numerous suggestions that people from across the state made. So we want to um, thank you for incorporating those into um, uh, these into this motion, but I want to make sure your motion incorporates all of her changes. Yes, it does. Okay, thank you. And did we have a second? Was it you, Commissioner Liu? Okay, we'll call it that. Okay, it was, uh, it was uh, Vice Chair Cardino, but. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Yes. Um, I wrote it. There was an affirmative nod that he accepted the changes. Okay, thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you so much, Hannah. We appreciate it. Now we're going to be going to the 2022 Solutions for Congested Quarters Program Guidelines Hearing for Northern California. Um, I think it was last week we did the Southern California Hearing on August 10th. In accordance with the Streets and Highways Code 2396A, California Transportation Commission is required to conduct at least one public hearing in Northern California and one in Southern California. So today will be our Northern California. As we've heard numerous times today, Californians are no strangers to congestion, especially as our state is home to some of the country's most congested travel corridors. Our regions have worked tirelessly to address the congestion crisis across the state by undertaking long-term innovative comprehensive and multimodal approaches that seek to reduce congestion by expanding travel choices, improving quality of life, preserving the local community character and balancing the state's climate goals. The Commission's Solutions for Congested Quarters program was created <clears throat> by the Road Repair and Accountability Act of 2017 on Senate Bill 1 to support the collaborative and comprehensive proposals to reduce congestion. 
Since its inception, the Solutions for Congested Quarters program has allocated over $1.5 billion to projects that are designed to reduce congested congestion in highly traveled quarters throughout the state. The total cost for these projects are collectively valued at over $6.1 billion. Projects such as the US 50 Multimodal Corridor Enhancement Project program for $110 million to extend the ex ex existing high occupancy vehicle lanes on US 50 to reduce congestion on the freeway that links Eastern Sacramento and communities in the foothills all the way down State Route 99 and Interstate 5. This project will also enhance multimodal options along the corridor to provide greater operational performance and reliability for all modes of travel. In the second cycle, the Commission programmed $500 million for seven projects. For example, the Placer Sacramento Gateway Corridor Project. Programmed for $67 million, this project is a package of multimodal improvements which will result in light rail station modernization, new bicycle and pedestrian facilities serving the Watt I-80 station area, over half of which is comprised of disadvantaged communities, and transportation systems management projects to improve existing transit services. These improvements are anticipated to make active transportation and transit truly viable by increasing peak hours transit and active mode trips by 23%. The project will also maximize the safety and efficiency of the region's transportation system by reducing fatal collisions by 5%. And certainly that's what we have talked about um, all day today. Once completed, the seven cycle two projects will save 250 million person hours of travel time, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 3.5 million tons, and reduce driving by 64 million vehicle miles traveled over a 20 year period. With the second program cycle coming to a close, the Commission's program staff has worked tirelessly to develop guidelines for the third cycle of Solutions for Congested Quarters program. The guidelines presented today were prepared by Commission staff in consultation with the California Department of Transportation, the California Air Resources Board, California Department of Housing and Community Development, the Commission's Equity Advisory Roundtable, regional transportation planning agencies, local agencies, and many other stakeholders. Commission staff regularly solicited stakeholder input and feedback through several public workshops, work groups, office hours, and meetings. Now, I'll turn it over to Naveen Habib, the Manager of Solutions for Congested Quarters Program to present the guidelines. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, this is Tab 18, and I am presenting the proposed 2022 Solutions for Congested Corridors Program Guidelines for the Northern Hearing. Before I dive into the draft guidelines, I will share a quick refresher about this competitive program, which was established in 2017's landmark legislation, Senate Bill 1. $250 million are appropriated annually from the state highway account to provide funding to regional transportation planning agencies, county transportation commissions, and the California Department of Transportation to reduce congestion throughout the state. The program is currently on its second cycle, covering fiscal years 2021-22 to 2022-23, with seven projects programmed for $500 million in funding. The 2022 Solutions for Congested Corridors program represents the third cycle of this competitive program. It will provide two years of funding in fiscal years 2023-24 and 2024-25 for a total of $500 million. The 2022 program underwent an extensive consensus-driven guidelines development process, reflecting agreement among our diverse group of stakeholders. We, the California Transportation Commission staff, planned and hosted seven public workshops to solicit input from various stakeholders, which included local, regional, and state agencies, private industries, non-governmental organizations, and general members of the public. These draft guidelines describe the policy standards and procedures for the development, adoption, and management of the Solutions for Congested Corridors, Solutions for Congested Corridors program. And they also address statutory requirements, incorporate stakeholder input, and include commission procedures for programming and project delivery. Since the inception of the program, the Solutions for Congested Corridors program guidelines have continued to evolve to address state policy goals. The 2022 program guidelines are no different. We collaborated with stakeholders to develop and incorporate the following key policy changes and updates in these proposed guidelines. We have elevated community engagement as an evaluation criterion used to determine project selection 
and added a new supplement, the SB1 Competitive Programs Transportation Equity Supplement, which provides community engagement and anti-displacement guidance, resources, and best practices to consider equity throughout the project nomination and selection process. We have expanded the consideration of climate impacts to incorporate key strategies from the Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure, also referred to as CAPTI. Specifically, Strategy 1.1 to prioritize multimodal and active transportation solutions, enabling travelers to opt out of congestion. This change was incorporated into Part 4, Section 17.1 under congestion evaluation criteria of the, of the proposed guidelines. Then Strategy 1.2 to require projects to be included in comprehensive multimodal corridor plans, also referred to as CMCPs. Senate Bill 1 requires all projects nominated for the Solutions for Congested Corridors program funding to be included in a comprehensive multimodal corridor plan prepared in accordance with the Commission's comprehensive multimodal corridor plan guidelines, which were adopted in December 2018. In previous cycles, the Commission was flexible and allowed applicants to submit existing plans if they were consistent with the Commission's guidelines. This provided applicants time to transition to prepare new comprehensive multimodal corridor plans to comply with Senate Bill 1 and now CAPTI Strategy 1.2. This change was incorporated into Part 3, Section 10 of the proposed guidelines. And finally, Strategy 7.1 to integrate pro-housing principles into the program guidelines. Commission staff collaborated with the California Department of Housing and Community Development to incorporate the pro-housing designation program to elevate and offer an additional option to meet the existing efficient land use evaluation criterion. This change is incorporated into Part 4, Section 17.2.6 of the proposed guidelines. Finally, we have added a public health subsection under Appendix A, Section I, under Other Optional Project Information Areas to clarify where public health information is captured in the guidelines and to emphasize projects that promote public health and why they're encouraged. In response to input received from the California Department of Public Health, we added additional public health related online tools for applicants in the climate change resilience and adaptation section and in appendix E, which is which is in the Senate, which is the Senate Bill 1 Competitive Programs Transportation Equity Supplement. I'd also like to share that we scheduled and hosted 18 virtual office hour sessions where we met with various applicant agencies one on one to address their unique project related questions and offered technical assistance and guidance as they develop their applications for the 2022 program. We also hosted one two hour long open office hour session where we addressed various general and technical inquiries about the 2022 program and the nomination process in a public workshop format. We receive positive feedback for our efforts and we plan to continue to host similar sessions in the future. This presentation is the culmination of over 12 months of a consensus driven process, which included meetings, workshops, work groups, and office hours, where commission staff collaborated with various stakeholders to responsibly prepare the cycle three guidelines. I would like to personally thank all commission staff, especially the entire SB1 programs team and the planning team for sharing their expertise lending support and providing guidance throughout this process. Additionally, I would like to thank all of our stakeholders and the respective staff at the California Department of Housing and Community Development and the California Air Resources Board for providing their expertise and input during the guidelines development process. This concludes the presentation of the proposed 2022 Solutions for Congested Corridors program guidelines for the Northern Hearing. I will now respond to any questions that you may have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Naveen. At this time, for anyone that's on the line, if you have a comment or question regarding the proposed 2022 Solutions for Congested Quarters program, please raise your hand um, on the GoToWebinar feature or type in a comment in the comment box. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, you can email Commission staff at sccp at catc.ca.gov and they can assist you. And in the meantime, I think we have Sophia that would like to make a comment. Good afternoon again, commissioners. Thank you for this opportunity to comment. We'd like to just support uh, climate plants comments and ask that the solutions for congested corridors program guidelines include clarification on how the projects will be considered and scored. Currently, the guidelines state that the projects will be ranked from high to low. Using the evaluation criteria and the high ranking projects will be prioritized for funding. However, there's little information 
on how those projects are ranked, especially for complex criteria such as community engagement. And we ask that the guidelines develop include a rubric for how to showcase how a project could achieve a high ranking to help improve transparency in the project selection process. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Next, we have Sarkis Katek from the Central Coast Coalition. Thank you, Chair Eager. Uh, commissioners, Commissioner Lugo, welcome to the commission. We look forward to working with you. Um, Sarkis Kotek with the Santa Barbara County Association of Governments. Uh, we are a member of the Central Coast Coalition, which is a group of uh, regional agencies on the Central Coast that comes together to speak as one voice on priorities from our region. Uh, we did submit a support letter for adoption of the local partnership Conget solutions for congested corridors and freight program guidelines. These programs are really important for us as small urban and rural areas because our annual formula money that we get would not allow us to deliver on critical transformative multimodal corridor projects. So having these opportunities is really important for us. And so we'd like to thank staff for all the collaboration and work they did with the um, guidelines. So thank you. Justin, do we have virtual comments? Yes, thank you, Chair Yeager. We do have virtual attendees looking to comment on this item. Up first, we have Sandy Naranjo. Greetings, Chair Commissioner. Sandy Naranjo, Policy Advocate for Climate Plan. Climate Plan would like to thank the CTC for the key proposed changes by elevating community engagement, by moving it from the appendix to the evaluation criteria, and for elevating climate by considering climate impacts by incorporating key applicable strategies of CAPDI to prioritize multimodal and active transportation solutions to enable travelers to opt out of congestion. As shared at the August 10th South SCCP workshop, Climate Plan recommends that SCCP guidelines should clarify what defines high ranking projects and low ranking projects and each evaluation criteria. Delineating between high ranking and low ranking can help ensure that projects selected in, are investing in communities that have historically been left out of the planning process and are showing how these impacted communities are deeply engaged in the development of climate friendly and equitable transportation projects. Thank you again for providing technical assistance and the work done on incorporating various stakeholders feedback and the updated guidelines. Thank you again. Thank you. Do we have others? Yes, I see uh, one other attendee with a hand raised at this time. Uh, I'd like to call on Aaron Hoyt. Great, thank you. This is Aaron Hoyt again from the Nevada County Transportation Commission. Just want to support uh, the staff's direction to adopt the guidelines today. Um, we want to also indicate that uh, we're uh, happy to see some additional details in the climate change and adaptation strategies included in this version. Um, these are really beneficial for Nevada County and other rural mountainous uh, counties in the Sierra Nevadas, um, where we're looking to transition to uh, zero emission bus fleets in the future. Um, and this additional language in here that would allow for um, uh, backup collector, uh, backup strategies to um, both store as well as provide backup power in unplanned outages or power shutoffs um, are truly beneficial because just as earlier this uh, month, we did have a unplanned power outage. And if we were in a situation that had um, a zero emission uh, bus fleets, we wouldn't have been able to deliver service all day to those community members who depend on it. Um, and we also want to acknowledge the the need for additional throughput on evacuation corridors. Um, sometimes these corridors are really the only lifeline and they happen to be state route highways that would provide direct access to uh, shelters and safe places for individuals trying to evacuate um, wildfire. So we want to thank you also for that language and appreciate your time today. Thank you, Aaron. Any others? I see no other public comment at this time. Thank you. And anyone else in the room? Uh, wonder what the response was to the comment about uh, how we score the projects and whether there's a, a more transparent way of doing it. Is that for Naveen? Commissioner Lou, I can I can handle that question since uh, I'm over here. Since all of our SB1 program, yeah, yeah, we're all over the place today. Uh, since all of our SB1 program, uh, competitive programs utilize a similar rating criteria. So, um, you know, 
an example that we would like to get closer towards, I would say, would be the active transportation program. I think you understand, uh, as well as any of the other commissioners, that's based on a numeric system, um, you know, from one to 100. And there's a very defined rubric in, in order to, uh, you know, score and allow evaluators to score each, each section. Um, while the SB1 competitive programs have maybe similar criteria, we will admit that uh, some of the criteria are more qualitative and base, and we do assign uh, evaluation teams that ultimately have consensus discussions on each evaluation criteria and come to a consensus on a final score for a criteria, and then that is ultimately how we get from you know low to high. Uh, we we have some internal rubrics for some of the criteria that, that our evaluators utilize, and we also rely on the Air Resources Board who evaluates the air quality criteria. So we leave that to them, as well as housing and community development will evaluate the pro housing land use criteria uh, and solutions and local partnership program. We're considering um, pulling in uh, an equity, uh, an advocate partner to assist us on the evaluation of community engagement. Uh, obviously, I think we have a primary expert on our staff with Sequoia Erasmus, um, who would be our, our initial go-to, but obviously um, we recognize that in order for our applicants to be successful, they need to know uh, the scale by which they'll be assessed. Uh, I will just say um, we were, not quite there yet. However, we we know that ATP might be the example that uh, we would we would like to get towards eventually. Any other questions? And I will close the hearing. Um, I'll go back to you, Naveen, for the resolution. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioners, this is tab 19 to adopt the 2022 Solutions for Congested Corridors Program Guidelines. The proposed 2022 Solutions for Congested Corridors program guidelines describe the policy, standards, criteria, and procedures for the development, adoption, and management of the Solutions for Congested Corridors program. These proposed guidelines address statutory requirements, incorporate stakeholder input, and include commission procedures for programming and project delivery. Pursuant to Senate Bill 1, 30 days before adoption, the Commission is required to provide the proposed guidelines to the Joint Legislative Budget Committee and the Transportation Policy Committees in the State Legislature. On July 14, 2022, the Commission submitted the proposed guidelines to the required legislative committees. In addition, Senate Bill 1 requires the Commission to conduct at least one public hearing in Northern California and one public hearing in Southern California to provide an opportunity for public comment. The Commission has hosted two public hearings, one for Southern California on August 10th, 2022, and one for Northern California on August 17th, 2022, or just now, before this tab, to provide an opportunity for additional public comment before the guidelines are presented for adoption. All key proposed changes to the 2022 Solutions for Congested Corridors program guidelines were addressed in the presentation of tab 18, again, immediately preceding this presentation. Therefore, staff recommends your approval to adopt the 2022 Solutions for Congested Corridors program guidelines as presented. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for Naveen? And I will entertain a motion. I think I saw Director Grisby raise his hand. <laughs> he did look at me, right? Okay. Uh, do you make the motion? Thank you. Do I have a second? Commissioner Liu, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Thank you, Naveen. Um, now we'll turn to tab 20. This is also a hearing. Um, this is pursuant to the Streets and Highway Code 2033 Part C. The commission is holding a hearing to provide stakeholders with a final opportunity to provide comments on both the 2022 Local Partnership Competitive Program Guidelines and the 2022 Local Partnership Formulaic Program Guidelines before the commission considers them for adoption. Before I open the hearing, I'll turn it over to Bridget Driller to provide re remarks on the guidelines. Thank you, Chair Eager. Um, and good afternoon, commissioners. As the chair mentioned, tab 20 is an informational item to provide a hearing on the proposed 2022 Local Partnership Competitive Program Guidelines and the proposed 2022 Local Partnership Formulaic Program Guidelines. The local okay. partnership program provides funding to jurisdictions in which voters have approved fees, tools, or taxes 
dedicated solely to transportation improvements or that have imposed fees dedicated solely to transportation improvements. Funding for the local partnership program is divided into two programs, the competitive program and the formulaic program. The competitive program guidelines and the formulaic program guidelines describe the policy standards and procedures for the development, adoption, and management of the programs. The proposed guidelines are a result of a consensus-driven process, meaning that these guidelines reflect agreement among our wide range of stakeholders. Both the competitive program and formulaic program guidelines were prepared by commission staff in consultation with Caltrans, the commission's equity advisory roundtable, the California Air Resources Board, the California Department of Housing and Community Development, regional transportation planning agencies, local agencies, and many other stakeholders. Following the initial Senate Bill 1 program's kickoff workshop in August 2021, the commission held seven public workshops to solicit stakeholder input. Also in new to this cycle, commission staff hosted 17 virtual office hour sessions for the local partnership competitive program from February to April, 2022, where staff provided technical assistance to applicants who wanted to discuss their project nominations. Before I ask the chair to open the hearing, I would like to thank our partners and stakeholders who participated in the workshops and provided feedback on the development of the draft guidelines. In particular, I would like to thank Josh Rosa, formerly with the Department of Housing and Community Development, for his assistance in developing new language related to the state's pro-housing designation program. I would also like to thank Christine Gordon, who served as the local partnership program manager throughout the workshop process and guidelines update process. Lastly, I would like to thank Anya Allenbacher, who's sitting to my left, as well as Kayla Giese, who's joining us virtually of the commission's local partnership program staff. With that, I will turn it back to Chair Eager to open the hearing. So at this time, uh, the hearing is open. Um, we do have one person who would like to speak. I think Sophia, you're up again. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you again for this opportunity to comment. You thought it was Thursday morning already, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we would like to ask that the local partnership competitive program includes the commitment to incorporate the Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure cap dive within the final program guidelines, other CTC funding programs such as the Active Transportation Program and the State Highway Operation and Protection Program. All include all explicitly state that those programs have to uh, consider cap dive as part of the program goals and objectives. And we ask that similar language is added to the local partnership program guidelines to ensure that this, this program is invested in uh, clean mobility options and sustainable transportation infrastructure. And we also uh, would like to ask that this program add zero emission infrastructure to the evaluation criteria, uh, as it's not currently listed there. Investing in zero emission infrastructure would help accelerate the switch away from using fossil fuels in the transportation sector and would make this option more accessible to the public, especially in rural communities. Promoting zero emission technology would not only help reduce pollution GHD emissions, but would also help this program comply with CAPDI and the governor's executive order to transition to 100% production of zero emission vehicles by 2035. California is currently drastically behind its goal of building 1.2 million EV charging stations by 2030 to accommodate all the zero emission emission vehicles that'll be on our roads by then. Without incentivizing local jurisdictions to build projects that include zero emission infrastructure, our state will fail to reach these important climate objectives. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we have someone online. Yes, we do have one virtual attendee looking to comment at this time. We have Sandy Naranjo. Hello, Chair and Commissioner Sandy Naranjo, Policy Advocate for Climate Plan. Uh, Climate Plan would like to thank the CTC for hosting workshops and engaging various stakeholders to receive input how to best improve the guidelines for the local partnership program, LPP, that resulted in an updated criteria for high priority projects. These updates include community engagement criteria that is in alignment with the CTC racial equity statement, accessibility criteria that improves accessibility to disadvantaged and or historically impacted communities, identifications of disadvantaged and marginalized communities along with their needs, input, and improvements. 
We thank the CTC for incorporating these updates as a step forward on advancing racial equity. At Climate Plan, we are concerned about the lack of incorporating CAPTI strategies within the LPP guidelines, considering that the recent AB 285 report found high levels of misalignment between our state climate targets and transportation funding, with only 2% of our transportation funding in alignment with climate. In the AB 285 report, LPP was one of the 11 transportation programs examined and found to be in the category of having the largest funding compared to the newer five transportation programs called out by AB 285, with an emphasis to improve mobility in California, but lacking the statutory funding commitments to address environmental protections or disadvantaged communities. For us to mean, meaningfully reach our climate targets, we must change the way we plan and fund our transportation programs. We've seen the incorporation of CAPTI within SHOP, TCEP, SCPP, and LPP should follow suit, so that it encourages the funding of CAPTI types of projects. And we also encourage an addition of, of the criteria and the criteria of zero emission infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any others? I see no other public comment at this time. So before I close the hearing, Bridget, did you want to respond to the CAPTI inclusion issue? Yeah, I would be happy to. Um, and actually, uh, I was planning as part of the next item in my remarks to discuss how CAPTI was considered within the local partnership competitive program guidelines. Um, so uh, I, I can uh, talk through those. Um, in general, the local partnership competitive program was one of the funding programs that was explicitly considered in the development of CAPTI. Um, and we have uh, incorporated a number of CAPTI strategies um, into the document. In general, we've tried to be consistent across the SB1 competitive programs um, where appropriate. Um, so for example, um, we have included um, new guidance materials in the guidelines, um, including the SB1 competitive programs transportation equity supplement. Um, the technical performance measurement methodology guidebook um, and the request for information on climate change resilience and adaptation and the protection of natural and working lands. Um, also, as Sandy mentioned, um, we've added new evaluation criteria related to community engagement and accessibility, which we hope will promote um, more equitable outcomes in project selection. Um, we have also um, work to incentivize uh, within the guidelines transportation projects that support infill housing production. Um, so we work directly with staff from the California Department of Housing and Community Development to incorporate information on the state's pro-housing designation program, as well as other housing and land use considerations um, within the evaluation criteria. Um, so uh, uh, just, to summarize in response to some of the comments we got, um, CAPTI was definitely top of mind um, within the development of the competitive guidelines. Great, thank you. Are there any other comments? And with that, I will close the hearing. Um, and now we'll move on to Bridget. You will present the resolution. Thank you, Chair. Um, so top 21 is an action item to adopt the 2022 Local Partnership Competitive Program Guidelines. The 2022 Local Partnership Competitive Program uh, represents the third program of the competitive, pro sorry, the third cycle of the competitive program. Uh, it, it includes two years of programming with $144 million. Um, as I mentioned, staff incorporated a number of updates uh, to the guidelines to support implementation of the Commission's racial equity statement, as well as CAPTI, so I won't go over those again. Um, but I will say that the draft guidelines were presented at the June 2022 commission meeting. Um, and at that meeting, we did not receive requests for modifications. We did, however, um, incorporate similar to the trade corridor enhancement program and the solutions for congested quarters program, um, the request for project impacts um, on public health is part of the program application. With that, staff recommends you adopt the 2022 Local Partnership Competitive Program Guidelines, which will initiate the call for projects for the upcoming cycle. Thank you, Bridget. Do we have any questions for Bridget? Yes, Commissioner Falcone. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, I wanted to congratulate, uh, just as my colleagues have, the staff for all their work on um, the SB1 guidelines a lot of tremendous a lot of amount of work um and so kudos to all of you um question bridget well actually could you respond to uh sophie's 
suggestion on including zero emission vehicle charging um, yes. into the guidelines. Yes, I would be happy to. Um, and so I'll start and I might ask uh, my uh, Deputy Director Matthew to jump in. Um, so uh, I've been with the local partnership program team for only three months now. Right. Um, so I'm new. During that time, um, I haven't heard a recommendation to add zero emission vehicles to the evaluation criteria. Um, the evaluation criteria were discussed uh, in depth throughout the workshop process. Um, but I will hand it over to Matthew Yascott to elaborate. Thanks, Bridget. Yeah, thank, thank you, Bridget. And I just want to say, having only been with the program for three months, Bridget is right up there, tip top uh, program manager in my book. Um, Commissioner Falcone, so zero emission infrastructure, zero emission uh, fleet, those are all eligible projects. And we have actually funded those types of projects in the local partnership program. Um, while we don't call them out as, uh, you know, in evaluation criteria, those types of projects would obviously be successful in air quality, uh, which is an evaluated criteria. Those types of projects would be successful in, there's a VMT evaluation criteria in the local partnership competitive program. So while we don't have a standalone evaluation criteria that says, if your project brings us zero emission infrastructure, um, you'll get, you know, extra points or you'll score better in this particular criteria. I would I would say that there are existing criteria that that, that type of a project will be um, more competitive if it includes okay. those components. Uh, for instance, just, just to give you an example, um, you know, if in, in cycle one, uh, we, we funded a bus rapid transit route in, in Los Angeles. And if, you know, that also included zero emission buses, it would have made that project more competitive versus if they were replacing those with, you know, diesel or hybrid buses. So, so th those types of, those types of projects would definitely be more competitive, even if they're not called out. Okay. Thanks for addressing that. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Commissioner Davis. I would just make the motion. I didn't have a question. Okay. By Commissioner Grisby, you have a... Did you have a question, Commissioner Grisby? Yeah, it was more of uh, for a uh, climate plan, if that's appropriate. I don't know if they're still on or not. For the question is for Sandy. Yeah, for Sandy. Yeah, okay. Well, you can listen to the, to the okay, great. <laughs> yeah. Just uh, wondering, Sandy, if you if you felt like Bridget's answer on CAPTI was uh, to your satisfaction, if you have any follow up to that. Hi, Commissioner. Can, can you hear me? This is Sandy. Yes, can you? Okay. Hi. Thank you. I I really appreciate the answer as far as how the development was in consideration consideration of CAPTI. Um, I think uh, language is important, just as um, when we were advocating for shop to incorporate CAPDI, CAPDI was mentioned, and there's conversations about um, changes for recommending CAPDI to incorporating CAPDI. So we believe that it's important to outline it um, in the um, in the guidelines. And so, um, you know, definitely appreciate that it was created in mind, but having language is crucial and key to ensure that you know we're moving to the point of aligning our climate mandates with our transportation planning and programs. So I just have a question for our team and whoever wants to answer can answer. Can you guys remind me, I know CAPTI had uh, went, went over individual programs and had specific recommendations for individual programs because they looked at it separately. What did CAPTI recommend for the local partnership program? Uh, thank you, Executive Director Weiss. Um, that's an excellent question. There was no specific strategy for the local partnership program that had any ask in CAPTI for, for us to include in that program. It might have been originally considered as an inclusion, but it was excluded with the final CAPTI. That so, so agency in adopting CAPTI looked at whether there should be specific recommendations for this program and decided there shouldn't be. I would assume that that is a correct assumption. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? We have a motion by Commissioner Davis. Do I have a second? Vice Chair Gardino. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Next, we'll move to Anya for the resolution for the Farm Relay program. Thank you, Chair Eager. 
Good afternoon, commissioners. Tab 22 is an action item to adopt the 2022 local partnership formulate program guidelines. The 2022 local partnership formulaic program represents the fourth cycle of the program and will include two years of programming in fiscal years 2023-24 and 2024-25 with $216 million. The draft guidelines were presented at the June 2022 commission meeting and staff did not receive requests for modifications. Overall, stakeholders have expressed support of the proposed formulate program guidelines. Staff recommends your approval of the 2022 local partnership formulate program guidelines as presented in attachment B of the book item and also with the technical change to the performance metrics section that Hannah Walters noted under her item in tab 17. We'll make that same correction. Uh, staff recommends your approval. Thank you. Any questions for Anya? I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve Martinez. Martinez moves. Second. Falcon seconds. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. We're now on tab 23. Laura. Good afternoon, commissioners. So tab 23 is going to be an informational item. Marlon Flournoy, Caltrans Division Chief for Transportation Planning, will present an overview of the draft 2022 addendum to the Interregional Transportation Strategic Plan, or the ITSP. The ITSP was approved back in October of 2021, and the 2022 State Transportation Improvement Guidelines uh, directed Caltrans to prepare an additional assessment of system needs in the strategic interregional corridors that are identified in the approved ITSP. So in response to that direction, Caltrans has prepared the draft 2022 ITSP addendum. It was released for public comment on August 5th, and the public comment period will close on September 30th. So with that context, I will hand it over to Marlon, who will provide an overview of the document and answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you. Just to confirm if you can hear me. Can, okay. Um, all right, thank you, appreciate that. Um, Laura, I appreciate the introduction. Um, good afternoon, Chair Eager. Um, Vice Chair Verdino and the commissioners. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate the opportunity to provide an overview of the draft uh, 2022 um, Interregional Transportation Strategic Plan Addendum. Uh, before jumping into the presentation, um, I'd like to uh, first thank our ITSP uh, program manager, uh, Kathleen Hanley, who's done just a great job at working with our partners and, and pulling this draft together. Um, I also want to thank our headquarters and district staff for their contributions. Um, as well as our partners, and, and but in the last but not least, uh, I want to thank Commission staff for their continued partnership. Uh, next slide. All right, so um, the ITSP is one of six modal plans that uh, that implements the California Transportation Plan, and it draws from other modal plans such as the uh, California State Rail Plan um, and the California Free Mobility Plan. Uh, the ITSP this P is a document that provides a policy framework for interregional travel, um, and it also uh, provides project prioritization framework for ITIP funding and nomination. Um, with all of this said, um, ITSP is also a tool for future plans and planning efforts at the state, regional, and local and quarter levels, as well as a tool for project development. Next slide. So the ITSP is updated every five years, um, and it was the last adopted um, in October of 2021. Uh, the 2021 ITSP designate the priority and regional facilities uh, within each of the 11 strategic and regional corridors. The corridors identified in the ITSP provide north, south, and east, west connections between two or more regions. And the ITSP includes a map, a table of strategies, and brief descriptions of the existing uh, conditions for each of the 11 corridors. Next slide. Um, so as Laura mentioned in her opening remarks, uh, the 2022 ITSP addendum was developed in response to the requirement uh, in the 2022 SIP guidelines 
uh, for the assessment of interregional uh, good needs. Uh, the 2022 uh, ITSP builds on the 2021 ITSP by highlighting each of the corridor's multimodal interdi interdisciplinary needs with brief text sections and uh, company visuals. Uh, the addendum does not designate any new priority and regional facilities or strategies. However, it does carry over the designations from the 2021 ITSP. The ITSP addendum uh, helps to implement the 2021, 2021 ITSP by providing more detailed information on the needs of each strategic and regional corridor. Each corridor includes uh, 10 page sections, which uh, provides uh, needs um, by Caltrans, other state agencies, regional local partners, advocacy groups, as well as community members. Uh, there are 18 strategies that are applied in various combinations across the 11 strategic and regional corridors, uh, depending on the specific needs of each corridor. Next slide. So I'm going to walk through just a couple of examples of the needs uh, identified in the addendum. Uh, this is a freight related need um, that utilizes Caltrans statewide truck parking data to show which truck parking facilities have capacity uh, during the peak. Uh, so in the map to the right, uh, it shows the, the size of the dot, which corresponds to the number of parking spaces, and the color indicates whether there's capacity during the peak. On I-5 in the North State, uh, truck parking is extremely limited, um, and, and even, at our large, even at the largest facilities. Uh, this can lead to truck parking on shoulders and on local roads, creating potential safety issues, as well as conflicts with other users. Um, so in the context of a corridor plan, this type of information will be helpful in identifying uh, specific needs and uh, locations related to expanding truck parking opportunities. Next slide. Um, so this example looks at integration of passenger rail and high-speed rail uh, to provide an interregional travel option along the Central Coast. Um, it's important that the Central Coast residents have access to the high-speed rail system. The two systems are planned uh, to connect at the San Jose station. Um, adding interregional transit uh, service uh, connections to Gilroy and Tulare high-speed rail stations would improve uh, the Central Coast uh, residents' access to the high-speed rail system. Next slide. Um, this is an example that shows the availability of battery, electric, and hydrogen stations along interstates uh, 10, 15, and 40 in Southern California. Uh, as shown in the map, there are many uh, stations in the urban western end and very few in the uh, rural areas to the east. Uh, this, this severity um, ex exacerbates um, air quality inequities and makes it difficult to uh, make interregional trips with alternative fuel vehicles. Um, staff have been following uh, the commission's work on SB7, excuse me, SB671 uh, to ensure that their analysis is folded into the ITSP. Next slide. So the addendum was developed uh, collaboratively with uh, state, regional, local partners. Um, the, uh, the process began in March uh, with stakeholder meetings for each of the 11 corridors. Uh, the meetings included staff from Caltrans districts, CTC, uh, regional local agencies, tribal nations, as well as community groups. The needs for each corridor reflected the input uh, from these meetings. Um, then we followed up with meetings to ensure that the document reflected local needs. Uh, Caltrans staff have met monthly with CTC staff to ensure the addendum was responsive and well aligned with the commission's work. And the draft addendum was posted to Caltrans ITSP website, as the board mentioned, on August the 5th, and will be out for public comment until September 30th. Uh, staff will be hosting weekly office hours for individuals uh, who would like to ask questions or discuss their comments. Um, and the draft addendum and office hours are available um, at the link uh, in the book item and on the next slide. Uh, with that said, I will conclude my comments and be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Marlon, thank you. Are there questions from my colleague commissioners? Then Marlon, don't go too far away. We're gonna move from item 23, which is an information item to item 24, which is the action item. Laura Pennybaker, are you able to patch it? There you are. Thank you, Laura. 
Here I am. Okay, so commissioners, tab 24 is an action item. Staff recommends the commission delegate the authority to submit comments on the draft 2022 Interregional Transportation Strategic Plan Addendum and to report back to you all at the October commission meeting. In our preliminary review, staff has identified some initial observations that we will use to further develop a formal comment letter. I'm gonna run through those very quickly. First and foremost, staff greatly appreciates the effort and process that Caltrans has put into this draft addendum. It provides excellent regional context for each corridor. So kudos to Marlin, uh, to Kathleen Hanley, and the whole ITSP team. The draft addendum would benefit from some enhanced information on the workshops and engagement that Caltrans has and will continue to conduct on the document. Additionally, the document would also benefit from some additional detail regarding potential improvements or strategies on the priority interregional facilities. And one strategy in particular that we would like to see consideration of is where reconnecting communities projects might make sense in the strategic interregional corridors. It would also be helpful if more information on alternative fueling infrastructure needs and potential solutions for freight vehicles was provided um, for corridors with high truck volumes. We feel that this is important given the fact um, that there are unique fueling needs for freight vehicles versus passenger vehicles. And also due to the fact that freight trucks are anticipated to be 100% zero emissions by 2045. And then lastly, the draft addendum does need to address Caltrans progress on ensuring consideration of the full system um, consistent with the direction that was provided in the 2022 STIP guidelines. So that being said, we appreciate Caltrans' commitment to working in coordination with us and with stakeholders to develop this addendum and to deliver the final addendum at the end of 2022. So staff does recommend your approval. I would be happy to answer any questions or take any additional comments, suggestions you may have at this time. Laura, thank you. Questions from colleague commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Grisby. Thank you. Uh, Laura, could you... Um, um, further um kind of uh, speak on the last item you talked about the oh yes okay. so within these step guidelines there is some specific direction um that asks caltrans as part of this assessment and in future iterations of the itsp uh, to include all state highways that are specified um, in the streets and highways code so the itsp covers a subset um in the form of uh, priority corridors and then um, facilities within those corridors. And we have asked Caltrans to, over time, show us how consideration of um, like the full entirety of the state highway system it is being uh, considered. So uh, we are hoping that they can provide an update on where they're headed with that particular direction. Does that answer your question? And we also have uh, uh, Commissioner Bradshaw from for a question. And I just want to mention that we also will have a speaker with the public, Patricia Chin, without a metro, if Patricia wants to warm up her vocal cords. Uh, Commissioner Bradshaw? Yes. Hi, hi Laura. Thank you. And uh, I just had a quick question. When we look at, um, and you may have answered part of this, but I, I lost the sound for a minute. Um, just looking at the general highway projects don't seem to be discussed in this addendum uh, but it talks a lot about obviously truck only lanes and things like that but i think i caught some of this you were commenting on it but it, is there going to be comments on just the general highway projects overall and also quickly uh how is this uh addendum going to be after the public comment and the process operationalized what's how's it it's going to supposed to kick start i understand the stated goal kick start the plan for 2021 but how's it actually gonna function? Those are great questions. So in terms, of, so you are correct. Um, I think as we ask uh, Caltrans to potentially provide more detail on strategies, I think we're looking at strategies across all, all modes within the corridor. And so we'll be crafting a comment um, to uh, address what you just raised. And then I would like to give Marlon a chance to talk about how they plan to operationalize it. And look, he came on camera, he's ready. Thank you, Marlon. Thank you, Marlon, too. I had a hard time getting getting my system working here. I would ask you directly. Appreciate it. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, yeah, appreciate the opportunity. Um, so, in terms of operationalizing, as far as next steps go, um, once we get the comments back, um, you know, by the end of the year, we're going to be 
uh, wrapping up the addendum. Um, but we're already starting to work with our districts. Um, you know, right now we have uh, a lot of quarter plans that are being developed across the state. Um, we've completed uh, some as well. Um, and our goal is to start um, prioritizing routes uh, as far as quarter plans go um, to basically focus in on all the different priority routes that are identified in 11 corridors. Um, and ultimately utilizing the, um, the, the quarter plans and the needs and the strategies that are identified, we wanna make sure that we're capturing those across the system. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're going to have a, uh, a comprehensive, you know, data set you know, that's going to include all the different uh, uh, pieces of data, you know, that are, lo are located in all the quarter plans. Um, and that's really, I think, going to be the jump point to start uh, prioritizing um, our resources to start developing projects um, to start getting them into the pipeline. Um, so um, hopefully that answers your question, but, um, you know, there, there's, and that's just, I think, the quarter plans. Um, there are also touch points as we're developing projects. We want to make sure that we're referencing um, the ITSP and, and different strategies that it's talking about to make sure that we're capturing those pieces. Um, I think our local partners can also benefit, you know, as they're doing work within their respective areas to start looking at the ITSP. And so we really kind of have like a multi-pronged approach in terms of implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Marlon, and thank you, Commissioner Bradshaw. We do again have one public comment. Patricia Chen, come on down. Uh, yeah okay thank you all right um so i uh, want to start out by um expressing appreciation for caltrans staff's efforts on collaboration and developing the itsp um and so thank you for that and we did send a letter in october uh, on the ITSP, and there are a few things that um, are kind of coming up again, and we want to mention. Also, I want to kind of preface this by saying I know STIP statute makes it difficult to do much on the strategic corridors within LA County. We pretty much have the I one, the US 101, and the I five. However, we also have two very major seaports and a lot of traffic that's going on to all the interregional corridors. And so we do want to continue to draw attention to this. Um, and let me see, I want to make it short. Who wants to listen to all this? Um, <laughs> we are at- I assume you were trying to say that to yourself. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Yes. Did I wait? I didn't say that out loud, did I? That, that was supposed to just be a bubble above your head. <laughs> um, we are at such a critical point for um, key goods movement infrastructure and the needs to address goods movement efficiency, particularly equity and climate concerns, are overwhelming. So um, we have gaps to close. In oh, the other thing is, I noticed there were was mention of a bike facility, that uh, the 66, and I was really happy to see that. And just in general, uh, Caltrans moving towards multimodality. Um, and I just wanna mention that we also have a 51 mile corridor from the headwaters of the LA River to Long Beach, um, which is not gonna be an excellent bike path. There are some gaps to close. So that is a good candidate to keep an eye on as well, especially since it does parallel portions of the US 101 and the I-5. Um, so with that, um, uh, I appreciate the creativity and flexibility wherever possible to be able to bring attention and resources to the corridor between uh, kind of connecting the interregional corridors and our seaports. Thank you. Patricia, thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to make public comment? I don't believe we have any other cards at the moment. If not, then is there a motion to approve? Uh, thank you. I always still want to call you chair, so I'm going to call you immediate past chair, Hillary Norton. Is there a second? Oh, wonderful. Adonia is our second, and we have a motion in the second. Is there any discussion? 
Okay, since I hear tummies starting to rumble and it's about the five o'clock hour, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The motion passes. And I'm going to turn it back over to our chair, Leanne Eager. Thank you. Now we'll move to tab 25, Hannah, to talk about the clean freight quarter efficiency assessment. Yes, thanks, uh, Chair Eager. So the clean freight quarter efficiency assessment is um, an assessment for the legislature and the commission is required to work with various state agencies to develop um, this report by December of 2023. So I'll be giving you a number of status updates um, between now and then, um, but here's a look at where we are now. Do I have slide, my slides up for this one? I'm gonna go ahead and start talking though. So um, you'll see a timeline slide in a minute, but the, the main things to take away are just that um, we hope to have a consultant on board to help us write the report by October and the report is due in December. <laughs> I, I can talk without them. I'll make this brief. Um, and we also hope to have a draft, an initial draft completed by August. So there's seven main requirements in the bill um, and, and I'll briefly give you a status about where we're at with them. So there are two, um, there are two requirements about identifying corridors. One is identifying corridors that are um, priority freight corridors that uh, need to be electrified or have hydrogen fuel. So they need to have zero emission infrastructure. Um, we've developed a draft of those corridors. Um, there's an example map in the attachment to this book item. Um, and so we wanted to, we will come forward at a future meeting and present those maps to you. Um, we're also, we're, there's also a, a requirement in the bill to identify um, the top five freight corridors with the most truck volume and diesel contaminants. Um, and so we are working with the California Air Resources Board um, on those maps. And we're also working with our Army Corps of Engineers, Engineer Research and Development Center staff. Um, and we will also bring those maps to you in a future meeting. Um, we've vetted the draft uh, barriers or challenges and recommended solutions um, through the work group. And we have quite a number of them. The full list of them is on our Senate Bill 671 website online. Um, they're posted on our website for public comment. And we're asking for public comment um, by the end of August if possible. Um, and then there's a requirement in the bill to identify projects and potential funding and project sponsors um, that would basically be for zero emission freight infrastructure mainly um, there to help fulfill the goals of the assessment. So we, in, in collaboration with the Air Resources Board, Caltrans and the Energy Commission developed a form for applicants to nominate projects for the report. We sent that form out to the work group and it's due September 1st. Um, and then there's three other requirements, methods to avoid displacement, the impact of um, the heavier weight of electric vehicles on roads and bridges, and benefits of the transition that we need to include in the report. And we are currently gathering information and have um, quite a bit compiled um, so that we can speak to those in the report. Okay, so there's, um, I'm, I'm not gonna go through all of the challenges and recommended solutions um, that I was planning to, but I wanted to highlight just a couple things. And I would also ask the commission um, to con or I, what I wanted to propose is that we um, include some of these um, barriers and recommended solutions um, in the California Freight Mobility Plan. So we're working with Caltrans to do that. And um, we would like to include some of these in the plan. So um, please let me know if you have any concerns with, the, with, these, um, with these barriers and, and recommended solutions. So one, um, one, one thing we spent a lot of time on was um, we made a comparison of, if you look at the ratio of uh, trucks to diesel stations currently, and what does that look like if you compare it to um, 2024 when some of the requirements of the advanced clean fleets rule would kick in. And what we found is that today, um, 
you have a, one diesel station could serve about 185 trucks. But in 2024, um, one zero emission truck facility could serve about 600 trucks. So that, and that number is changing. It's just a point in time estimate, but that's not really a feasible or supportable option. Um, so our takeaway um, from that is that we really need to try to work to um, get some of this infrastructure built as quickly as possible. And so some of the key recommend, uh, recommendations that I wanted to point out, um, we should consider how we can provide significant public subsidies um, upfront to help um, provide some of the capital that's needed to fund these infrastructure projects. Um, we should uh, identify a CEQA lead agency for the projects identified in the report and um, some funds for uh, a, a budget funds to pay, help pay for CEQA and a CEQA lead. Um, we might want to recommend having the legislature support a bill for a new categorical exemption if needed to um, help some of the projects in the report get built. There's some existing categorical exemptions from CEQA, um, but there may be more needed. Um, we need to work, and we are working, with the Energy Commission and the Public Utilities Commission to um, make sure that the demand estimate that the Energy Commission develops every year and gives to the Public Utility Commission will include um, the need that is um, estimated for electric vehicles and also for um, hydrogen distribution. Um, and hydrogen fueling stations. So we need to make sure that um, the energy needs associated with CARB's new regulations gets into the main energy estimate that the CPUC uses. So we're working to do that. Um, and then trying to make our funding process simpler. And I, won't, I, I won't go through all these. I will just say one more thing, and that is that um, as we've stated before um, in previous um, updates, that freight is really important and it's responsible for about one third of our state's economy and 5 million jobs. So the advanced clean fleets rule is gonna have a lot of advantages, but we also recognize that this transition is gonna pose significant challenges for fleets and we need to work with our businesses to support them in this transition. Um, because especially with electric charging, they have um, less um, cargo capacity, so they can't move as many goods. They can't go as far, so they might need to buy more trucks. Um, if they're gonna go the hydrogen route, because that doesn't have some of those challenges, it's uh, liquid hydrogen is very expensive. Um, the trucks themselves are about three times the cost. Um, and it takes, if they're gonna charge, it takes incredibly a lot longer to charge and the drivers don't have that in their schedule time because time is money. So these are real, very real challenges that we need to work through. Um, and, and some of the solutions that the work group has come up with is um, like um, decreasing the total cost of ownership, trying to work to do that, providing good leasing options, using truck as a service models. That's where a company will provide all the services from beginning to end um, and financing um, energy, like basically financing the creation of energy um, and electricity and hydrogen all the way through to distribution and to the station. So, um, and we also need to look at specific solutions for the border of US and Mexico because we have quite a high volume of trucks coming in from Mexico um, to our logistics facilities near the border, but um, they don't have charging on the Mexico side and they don't have um, the same regulations that we do. So th these are just some, um, some things that we're thinking about um, and some solutions that the work group has, has come up with. And I think I'll end it there and that concludes my update. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Thank you, no, no, that, that was great information. And certainly uh, as we're looking at solutions for this, um, we, it's, it's good to remind us that um, freight is important. Getting our products up and down the state and in and out of the state uh, is certainly something that will continue um, but some of those things like maybe manufacturing those trucks here instead of bringing them in might lessen some of the costs. So uh, encouraging manufacturing is also important. Um, I think we have a comment. Do we? I 
I do. I'd like to add something, Tanisha, with the commission. Um, just one thing to add to what Hannah has said is that um, it's important to recognize that we continue to work through this process and there are additional milestones in which we will be asking the commission to weigh in and to provide additional <laughs> feedback. So what we've heard from Hannah is what we've heard from our work group. We're going to get some more additional feedback from uh, other stakeholders. And Hannah, has, you have a document out right now for those recommendations so that we're building ownership within the commission as well. And you're giving us feedback to these documents as we start to talk and consult with Caltrans on what should go into the CFMP, what should not go into the CFMP in terms of how it's moving forward with the Commission's direction. Neil, do we have a comment? Yes, thank you, Chair. Again, we do have public comment at this time. Uh, first, I'd like to call on Norman Emerson. Norman, you're free to unmute yourself and make a comment. While we wait for Norman, I just want to point out, while we didn't get the PowerPoint up, it's an attachment to everybody's item. So, so everybody has it and, and the public can look at it. Doesn't appear that Norman is uh, with us at the moment. So I would like to move on to uh, Annalisa Bevan. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on this item. My name is Annalisa Bevan and I'm CARB's Zero Emission Infrastructure Specialist. My team and colleagues at CARB have been working closely with Hannah as part of the work group and one-on-one -on, -one on this effort. We very much appreciate the close degree of collaboration that has been developed over this last year. Hannah's openness to feedback and her team's commitment to incorporating data and policy components from CARB is very much appreciated. The results of this work are super important to CARB as we pursue adoption and implementation of our medium and heavy duty vehicle uh, ZEV regulations, including the proposed advanced clean fleets regulation. As identified in Hannah's presentation, there are a number of challenges facing the transition to ZEVs. The solution oriented process taking place through the AB 671 work groups and input from stakeholders is particularly constructive and aligned with CARB's approach to implementation of the state's ZEV targets. The near-term focus on fueling infrastructure support is especially important. Many fleets are ready to make this transition, but they need fueling infrastructure solutions. We look forward to assessing how the results of this assessment will help frame future policy actions at CARB and other agencies as we implement transition to zero emission vehicle technologies for medium and heavy duty vehicles. Thanks again for the opportunity to comment and for the collaboration um, developed through this program. Thank you. Do we have any others? I see no other public comment at this time. Thank you. Do we have any comments from commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Norton. Yes. Thank you. Uh, this is a really huge amount of work that's being done. And I think that the intricacies of making sure that we have these other participations with other departments seem really um, timely, especially as we're looking at strategies for some of the transportation corridors and going after funding on the federal side and on the state side. And so I was wondering to what extent the governor's new infrastructures are is going to be looking at coordinating all of this as there are now funding opportunities to line up with both the zero emission infrastructure and how we want to invest in our trade corridors and lining that up together seems to be a really big part of what your task force is doing, but I want to make sure that we're also lining up the opportunities to go after funds to make this all happen. There's a lot of thinking in here, and I'm really impressed with the thoughts about how we're going to align um, fueling, if you will, with charging um, so that you can actually have longer corridors be served by fueling and charging at the right place. But it also means that we've got a lot of coordination on the timing for funding. And I just want to make sure that there's that lens as well. Can I jump in and, and, and answer that a couple of ways? First of all, we have not had conversations uh, with the, the newly appointed czar, but we look forward to those. Or maybe Hannah has. She's telling me I'm wrong. Well, I believe you're, you may be referring to Trayland 
Bradley, I think, is who the new governor's is that actually it's, it's Antonio Virgoso, but Trey Lynn is doing it through the governor's office of business development. But okay, well, talking then, about then, then executive director Weiss is correct because I haven't talked, I've only talked to Trey. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, 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 this yeah. 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 Give, give him time to, to sit down, but we only meet every two months, so I'm just saying, you know, yeah, yeah. So, um, but the other thing we have talked about internally, so we just finished up this round and all this work our team has done to to do these guidelines, but we're also looking at, okay, so how do we move forward in a way that that tries to help maximize getting federal funds? So our, do we need to look at our timing of our program? Should we do be, be other things to better align what we're doing in California with? So we're, we're absent conversations with anybody. We are looking at that because we think that we recognize the importance of that. Thank you very much because you know, we only get to talk on the mic you know, now to October. So I, I just want to plant that so that we can be working on it throughout this time. Thank you. Any other commissioners have comments? Yes. Commissioner Falcone. Wow, Hannah, no rest for, rest for the weary. You just got to tease up. Uh, you know, this is a huge, um, huge issue and a huge undertaking. So I, I Thank you for, for taking this on and for all the work that you've done already. I know personally that you have, you know, really dug in deep um, and really tried to learn um, and, and hear from, from the freight community, you know, their anxieties of how they're going to comply, um, you know, with these mandates and, and to convert. So thank you for, for talking to the, the folks that I've connected you with. Um, and incorporating uh, some of the comments I've made in the past in terms of, you know, how how freight that crosses the border, um, not only in the U.S.-Mexico border, but also with the other states. You know, what is there going to be alignment with 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 those um, those destination points? So it's going to be a lot of work. I look forward to hearing all of your updates and you know to providing whatever support I can. Um, to you and, and, and your efforts in this. So thank you, Hannah. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Falcon, and thanks for your um for your input. Yes, Commissioner Liu. Thank you. Um yes, I, I I'm I'm gonna second all the support for all the work you've done and, and put into this and, and how far you've gotten this, how quickly and, and how complicated a subject it is. You're doing an absolutely outstanding job with it. Um, other than the fact that I can't find the link to the barriers and solutions uh, uh, list uh, on the website. Um, outside of that, it's all great. There, there was, we had this interaction about the list of projects, right? It's, it's very much um, geared toward trucks and, and the infrastructure and all that. And there's no mention of mode shift, which is perhaps getting some of those trucks off the road by putting things on rail or doing short sea shipping and things like that. Um, that can help relieve congestion. And then you pointed to the legislation, which I looked up, and sure enough, the legislature and its great wisdom or lack thereof did not include mode shift as an example, but they did use the term including but not limited to. So this is one of those instances where that in, we're going to take advantage of, we need to take advantage of that including but not limited to. I would ask that when you, you meet with a work group, you ask them about the idea of mode shift and how that plays into all of this and what input they, they would have and recommendations uh, on mode shift. Okay, sure, I'll ask them. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Hannah? Yes, Commissioner Lugo. Yeah, I think I got my mic turned on here. Um, so Hannah, I have a question about how uh, the communities who have been most impacted by our current freight corridors have been included in the the work that's been ongoing either with the work group or I noticed in the in the language that there's some uh, mention of you know wanting to avoid displacement of residents and I think that you know increasing public health reducing pollution is all in there but it was just wondering if there's been a particular strategy um, to ensure that communities environmental justice communities who um, have been the most harmed by our current systems are well positioned to benefit from the changes that we'll be making through these 
um, different freight corridors? Yeah, that's a good question. And we definitely do want to be um, considerate of um, the needs of those communities as we're developing solutions for the report. Um, up front, we have some advocacy organizations uh, on the work group. And I'm sorry because I can't remember exactly what they are right now, but I know there's like two or three of them and they uh, make comments in the meetings. Um, and so we hear from their perspective. Um, we, we also are working, one of the things that we're using um, in our map of the top five freight corridors that we're working on with, with the Air Resources Board is Cal Enviro Screen 4.0. So we're looking at, um, and, and you might know this, but um, that tool takes um, a variety of um, air quality indicators and then socio um, de demographic, it's demographics um, and socioeconomic indicators, um, and then combines them into one score. And um, so we use a map layer that shows the um, communities that have the lowest score in other words like they're the most burdened by air, bad air quality and so we're looking at those um, corridors and um, seeing uh, where it might be needed especially from an air quality standpoint to um, transition to zero emissions as soon as possible um, but i also think that in addition just to the need to transition to zero emissions we just need to think about the infrastructure that we're creating in those communities so we do know that and we will keep that in mind when we're um, looking at the projects that are submitted for the report and try to work with um, the people who know more about what's needed in those communities. Thank you. Okay, last call. Any other questions for Hannah? Okay, thank you, Hannah. Um, we are gonna go ahead and go on to uh, tab 26 because we're about two hours behind. Um, so at this time, we'll turn it over to Monica. Good afternoon, commissioners. Tab 26 is an information item. We are joined today by Chad Edison, Chief Deputy Secretary of Rail and Transit of the California State Transportation Agency for a presentation on the fifth cycle of the Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program. The program's awards were announced on July 7th, 2022 and includes 23 projects totaling $8 million. Mr. Edison will provide additional details about the cycle and its awards. Mr. Edison. Thank you very much. And I hope everybody can hear me fine. I'll go, I'll go through these slides uh, fairly quickly because I think um, I'm one of the main things between you and dinner right now. Um, but I, uh, to, to begin with, first, we're, uh, we're very happy to be able to present to the commission um, the, the award cycle that we just finished. And I'm also gonna speak to some of what's coming um, in the future of funding and allocations that have been referred to earlier in the meeting. Go to the next slide, please. Um, the T TRCP um, since 2015 has, has distributed $6.6 .6 billion in funding to 97 projects throughout the state. And we're about to do far more than that with the money that was just put in the budget. Um, much of this money has also helped to obtain federal and other funding um, streams um, through a number of contingent awards that we've made. Uh, the program focuses on priority populations um, to make sure that each project contributes directly and assured benefits to those communities in, um, and households. And if you push down one more, one more item here, we also have a geographic equity focus. Um, on the next slide after this, um, the statutory requirements of the program. Um, sorry. I don't have control of the slide deck here, do I? Please advance the slides. Okay, on, on to the next slide. Um, the statutory requirements of the program are that we have a competitive five-year program to fund a small number of transformative projects um, that are improving statewide network and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We have a number of evaluation criteria that are identified in statute. Those are to have greenhouse gas emissions reductions, ridership growth, achievement of integrated service and safety benefits. And then our secondary evaluation criteria focus on a number of other factors, uh, co-benefits of sustainable communities goals, um, geographic balance, network integration, housing and jobs considerations. Um, to give a little background on the kinds of projects that we have funded in the past, um, next slide will show you um, the, uh, some of the partial uh, list of those awards. Um, some of these will be very familiar to people in the region that you're in right now, such as the uh, 
the um, BART Silicon Valley Phase Two project, which has received uh, $750 million in past awards from our from our program, a number of LA Metro projects, um, both light rail and, um, and 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 then also some MetroLink um, extensions down there. Um, we have had both fleet and bus projects um, related to uh, both uh, you know the BART fleet and SACRT, as well as bus projects um, throughout the state. Um, in this round that we just did, nearly $800 million was awarded to 23 projects. That was 23 of the 50 applications we received. So if you go on to the next slide, I've uh, categorized these in, in three categories. Um, first, we have transit and rail infrastructure projects. The two largest projects, um, each of them over $100 million, were the San Francisco Muni project to do a number of rail and bus corridor improvements, as well as to begin their train control system upgrades. Um, and then in with LA Metro, uh, we're doing next gen bus investments that includes over 80 miles of transit priority lanes, 261 uh, vehicle replace vehicles that are being replaced with zero emission buses. And it's converting all of the frequent tier one and tier two corridors out of two operating divisions that cover a wide geographic um, area um, south of downtown and um, it's south of downtown and to the west. Um, we also have uh, the further extension of the Ace Valley Rail project at Turlock. We have a number of other projects around, around the state. Um, we're really happy with the ge geographic distribution that we had this time. We had some really strong projects in areas that have not previously put in applications, um, and uh, that was good to see. Um, Monterey Salinas Transit is um, one of the projects that is pursuing federal funding. They are in line for a, uh, a federal grant, and our money will help them obtain that. Um, so on this, and, and ACE is also pursuing federal money. Um, we're, we're excited to be working with a lot of agencies that worked in partnership with others. So the Sonoma re region, Sonoma and Mendocino County worked together to do a whole set of regional rail and bus connectivity improvements. Um, that includes a smart Petaluma North station, but it also includes zero emission buses for a number of the operators in the region. Um, on to the next slide. Um, one of the things that was notable this time were some of the transit-oriented development kinds of projects. The first two on this list are particularly that way. BART is investing in three of its stations, and the, and the infrastructure investments through this program are enabling the development of, of dense housing, including, a, including a, a, a large amount of affordable housing um, that is going in at these station locations. They're also investing in active transportation infrastructure and otherwise improving access to the station. We're very excited about these three projects that are within the BART system. Um, the Humboldt Transit Authority has a major transit center that also has a housing um, project associated with it. Um, and there's going to be um, both workforce and universities housing at this location. Um, they're going to have a really nice transit center downtown and they're also starting their conversion to zero emission buses, including some that are gonna run all the way down into Mendocino County and connect with other services. Um, there's uh, th there are a number of other projects throughout the state. The the, the Cross Valley uh, bus bus and rail project in Tulare and Kings County is very exciting. It includes a couple of transit centers, and that will help the the, the various operators in that region um, improve their customer customer experience. And uh, we're also working with San Diego MTS to rehabilitate their 12th and Imperial Transit Center. So again, um, a number of um, exciting projects in the award group. The final slide is our last category. This is really a full, except for the LA Metro uh, 261 buses. This shows all the other projects that have uh, buses and vehicles in them. Um, I'm not going to read the list to you, but you can see the wide variety of agencies that are that are going getting either zero emission buses or micro transit vehicles, uh, light rail vehicles, ferries, etc. And um, this is a um, a key component of our program. Um, many of these will also be going after CARB, um, CARB HVIP vouchers or other kinds of grants, and some of them are already using the money they receive from us to, to pursue and leverage our money into additional awards, including federal awards. So that is something that we encourage. Um, I'm going to wrap up with two slides, one on funding and one on allocations, and then I'll take any questions. Um, our funding historically has come primarily through the Transportation Improvement Fee Revenues and SB1 and a continuous 10% cap and trade appropriation. 
Um, this year, we had $796.1 million of new funding for projects, and those projects will be delivered, um, well, we'll get their allocations through uh, fiscal year 26-27. Um, in addition, uh, this year's budget um, put $3.65 billion of general fund that's available now and has $4 billion more that's in the next two, two fiscal years. Um, at least $1.8 billion of that will go to projects that have previously received funding from us, at, um, at, and this is a, a statutory a budget direction. That money will go out the door very relatively quickly because some of these projects have already are already in construction and are looking for funding from us in order to assure that they continue to receive their federal funds. And so um, when, when we're talking earlier in the meeting about um, the, 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 the amount of money you can allocate and you see some of these large balances, some of that 1.8 billion or more will will go to projects that are going to find a very quick use for it as they as they try to bring projects that are already under construction to their conclusion. Um, others others are about to get their federal funding commitments and, and the money they receive through this round of funding that's coming up um, will be very useful in 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 in, in its locking down that federal funding commitment. There's also 150 million dollars for project development. Um, there are statutory program allotments for, for, for Southern California, the Los San Rail Corridor, and the rest of the state. And as I mentioned earlier, there's the $4 billion in formula funds for regional agencies in the next two fiscal years of the program. Um, the final slide I'll show here just gives you a little bit of a sense of how our first four cycles fit. And this, this also kind of speaks to the allocation discussion that was earlier in the meeting. Um, one of the things that we've been preparing for ever since cycle three is a number of very large projects that we're going to go into construction um, in fiscal years 22, 23, the current fiscal year, in the next couple of years. And, and many of our awards back in 2018 were for projects that were preparing for that construction that might not start until as late as uh, even next year. Um, and so what you see here is the very large um, expected allocations that will happen in this fiscal year and next and the one after that, even before we have the cycle five and cycle six projects included in here. Um, and that's that's really tied to these major major uh, projects um, that, that, are, that are going to be uh, ready for their allocations, such as BART to Silicon Valley uh, phase two, um, some of the LA Metro projects and so forth that are getting ready to make those allocation requests at the CTC. So that's a little preview. And we, we update this regularly. We can uh, come back and, and give you an update on this anytime um, based on the most recent um, allocation expectations that we have. But um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And um, that's my last slide. And I'd be glad to take any questions. Does anyone have any questions for Chad? Yes, Commissioner Falcone. Thanks, Chad. Um, I'm kind of a visual person, and this is a lot to take in. <laughs> um, do you have like a, a map that geographically shows your distribution of your allocations? Um, we, we don't have that created right now, but I'd be glad to uh, to go ahead and, uh, and and put that together for the commission if you'd like that. Just to kind of show, you know, where the, you know, the allocate, how, how things have been distributed throughout the state. Um, and, you know, and just kind of seeing as you start to allocate um, the next cycle, you know, where, where some of those gaps may be. Yeah, so just to clarify the question, are, are you looking for the history of the program or this this coming cycle or both past as well okay yeah thank you okay and a lot of, i believe a lot of these projects are loaded up on the sb1 kind of database but, but um that might not create the visual result that you're looking for so i will i will um consult with the commission and staff and figure out the best way to, to show that to you commissioner thanks chad so commissioner bradshaw did you have a question uh, just really more of a statement um chad thank you so much for the presentation and the good work uh i'm pretty familiar with the uh tod uh, bart projects right and just wanted to say you know real real compliments to you and the team and all the players um for me it hits it hits a lot of the boxes uh it's infill transit oriented great jobs local hire uh, it's union conditions, frankly, uh, certainly a partisan there, but those deals were, were struck. But when those projects come online, when you look at what happened with BART, Carther, uh, 
it starts to really bring real solutions on the housing, environment, affordability, job creation. Uh, so I just wanted to say, uh, you know, fantastic job. And it's good to see the more projects coming that way. And what's going to be happening now moving into San Jose, which Mayor Licardo was talking about, is really great. So I just wanted to say, you know, great job uh, and, and keep it up. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Have any other comments? All right. Thank you, Chad. Appreciate it. Thank you. Are you going to stop here? Okay, we're going to keep on keeping on. Gertesh, you're up. Thank you, Chair Eager. Commissioners, tabs 27 through 36 are information items that have been reviewed and found to have no issues raised by Commission staff. If there are no questions or comments, that will conclude the presentation of the information calendar. Oh, I'm glad I kept going then. <laughs> Any questions, comments? No? Okay, then we'll take tab 37. Commissioners, tabs 37 through 57 are action items listed as part of the consent calendar. Please note the changes to tabs 40 and 42. If there are no questions on any consent calendar items, then staff recommends approval of tabs 37 through 57 on the consent calendar. Do we have any questions from commissioners? Do we have any comments, questions from uh, virtually? I see no public comment at this time. Thank and you. I will entertain a motion. Second. That was Norton and Davis. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, we're going to do two more. We can do it. We can do it. All right, we will move to 58. Jose. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Commissioners, and members of the public. Items 58 and 59 will be combined in observance of time constraints. Item 58 is an action item. This is the final EIR for the city specific for the central city specific plan, including the downtown Sacramento grid 3.0 mobility project. The Sacramento City Council adopted a statement of overriding considerations, finding that the benefits outweigh the impacts. Item 59 is an action item. This is the final EIR for the Hopper Slough bridge replacement project. Caltrans adopted a statement of overriding considerations, finding that the benefits outweigh the impacts. Staff recommends approval of items 58 and 59. Thank you, Jose. Do we have any questions or comments from commissioners? Any online? No public comment. And I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second, Martinez. Commissioner Norton moved. Commissioner Martinez, second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, I think we made it through our entire agenda. Um, as we said at the beginning of the meeting, we're going to adjourn today um, in memory of Ali Shabazz. And thank you all for attending today. We'll see you tomorrow.